Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a very special one-shot adventure using the Daggerheart Open Beta version 1.2 playtest guide. My name is ELH the Game Master, and joining me are three lovely individuals, perhaps a fourth one if they uh, show up eventually. But for the time being, it will just be the three of us. Uh, what I would say is that Daggerheart, if you're unfamiliar, is Darrington Press, uh, Darrington Press, Press being the same people behind Critical Role and Candela Obscura. Uh, Daggerheart is meant to be the quote-unquote D&D competitor, where it takes a lot of good ideas from a variety of sources and other TTRPGs and tries to do something unique and original. And if you haven't already, chances are if you're watching this, you've seen it already. But I recently did a video with Benno where I reacted to the basic video that uh, Critical Role put out of what is Daggerheart? And I was very positive at the end of that video, so I thought, hey, I'll get a one-shot together and I'll just see if it plays as well as I think it will. Um, one thing I will say up front is that I... How do I want to say this? As much as I want to give feedback about the game, there are going to be times where I fudge the rules or times where we're just going to make a call in the moment. So I'm going to be doing my best to keep to the rules as they're explained in the quick start adventure. But just know that if we, you know, fudge something that we're just trying to keep the game going. Um, the, what I would say is that the quick start adventure does claim that you can do the entire session without looking at the main core rule book. So we're going to test that theory. We're going to see if we can actually get through this packet and just this packet, kind of like if we were at a convention, but that's enough for me. Let's quickly go around the table, have everyone introduce themselves, introduce their characters, and then we'll get started. So I think since, uh, Marlo is kind of the star of the show here, uh, GM Josh, if you'd like to go first. Oh, geez, the star. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm GM Josh, also Josh. I've uh, played with ELH a lot on primarily Star Trek Adventure stuff. I'm um, a longtime 5th edition GMer, uh, so very interested in the setting and, and um, you know, the new stuff we can get into. So I'll be playing Marlo Fairwind. She is a lore-born elf of a primal origin. Very interesting to see what this actually turns out to be. I imagine her... Race is is probably more of like uh, Hylians from uh, Legend of Zelda. At least that's kind of what I think. And that they probably used to be magical, but they've lost their abilities. And I, I think that Marlo is probably someone that has a natural instinctive magic to reflect her, her stat. But yeah, we'll see how she plays. I nice. like it. I like it. Up next, we're going to go to Steadfast Pig. Hello, I'm Steadfast Pig, uh, otherwise known as Richard in the life. Uh, I'm playing Garrick Reed. There's a highborn human warrior um, who seems pretty fun. Uh, I'm also a forever GM in the real life. I run a game store in Georgia, and uh, so it's just always what I do. And when I saw that Critical Role um, was making a system, I read the entire book overnight and didn't sleep. And, and, and then I saw that EOH was going to run a game, and I was like, put me in there. Because uh, I play in the Hanasto game, so I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to go. I'm very excited. Love it, love it. And last but not least, Squiff. Hello, everyone. I'm Mal, also known as Lone Squiff in the Hidden Library. Tonight, I will be playing Kari Nix, the giantess, Wanderborn, and she will be she's the guardian class. Very much looking forward to playing this. Looks fun. Okay. Now, one quick thing I will say before I do the opening narration is we are going to be using Foundry for our virtual tabletop. Uh, if you're looking at the screen right now, you can already see that we're able to roll with hope and fear. Uh, I will be doing my best to explain things as we go. But if you are someone looking into potentially running Daggerheart, uh, I would say that there is a Foundry macro that is already on the subreddit. should be r slash Daggerheart. And I'll also do my best to remember to link it in the video description if you're watching this on YouTube. But without any further ado, let us begin. So, Marlo Fairwind, you are the right-hand sorcerer of King Emeritus. And he has tasked you to gather your most trustful allies to carry an important package to Hush, a small village within the ancient forest of Sablewood. The crate itself is large, heavy, and sealed with magic, 
And on top of it is an address to someone named the White Fire Arcanist. You've been given a map and a carriage, as well as the promise of a reward once you make a successful delivery. Now, the Sablewood itself is a seemingly endless forest of dark trees that reach hundreds of feet towards the sky. Some say that they've been here since the time before the Forgotten Gods. And what's unique about the Sablewood, and this is where our Avatar people are probably going to be a little bit excited, is that the Sablewood has unique hybrid animals. So things like lemur toads and tiger elk and deer tiger, um, as well as uh, trade routes that are populated by traveling merchants. And the thing about these hybrid animals is they can be completely docile to extremely vicious. So you kind of have to be very much on guard as you travel through the Sablewood. As for Hush, you know that there is this small friendly village that is sort of warded against the rest of Sablewood. Um, and that is your current destination. So where we begin is all of you, uh, except Marlo, are in the back of a cart. Um, one thing I would say is that as the cart kind of trundles along, you hear the strange sounds of these hybrid animals, the the bird calls of the lark moss, the, the croak of the lemur toads, the, the startled roars of the deer tiger. Um, but what I'm curious, and this is something that the play test recommends, and I like how they do that, huh. is that there's something unique about the look of the trees here in Sablewood. And it's an open question to the table. What's unique about these trees? It can be anything. Can, can we see the trees from the, the cart or? Oh yeah. They're, they're lining the current pathway that you're trundling along. Huh. What if they're wild color, like they're pink or something? Okay. Yeah. Vibrant pink? Okay. I like it. So kind of Probably like a like, like maybe a cherry blossom almost. Cool. I like it. So as you are going through this long array of like redwood cherry blossoms as I have in my mind now, um, your carriage kind of rounds a tight corner. And just for a moment, a wheel comes off of the ground and... Before you in the road, as you round the corner, is an overturned merchant's cart that's laying sideways in the path. And you see that there's a scattering of fruits and vegetables littering the trail. And from around the side of the carriage is a Strix wolf, uh, kind of this large creature that looks like a griffin. So kind of body of a wolf, face of an owl, large feathered wings. And it's chewing something. And is staring at you with curious eyes as if to judge whether you are friend or foe. And it is at this moment that I ask, what would you like to do? Oh, my. I, just a quick question. Is Marlo yes. with the group? You said that the others were in the cart. You are le you're the one steering the cart. You're okay, driving. So oh, okay. Marlo's driving. Okay, cool. Yeah. What type of are there animals that are that are moving us forwards? Also hybrid animals? Uh, no, they're just standard horses. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know if they were <laughs> they were standard horses or not. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I mean, we could always just change that. Do you want them to be something? No, no. I, I was I was curious. I had no idea if the uh, if the quick start <laughs> had had answered that question or not. No, nah, it actually leaves it very open. So maybe I'll make a note of that. Like, say huh. what the steeds are. Got That's it. cool. Okay. I think but Marla. Yeah, what would you pull... like to do? You. Uh, I think Marla would. Wolf. I think Marla would pull the horses or whatever we're going to have them to be. She'd, she'd pull the, the cart to a halt and she'd look back to Garrick and Kavi and she'd say, you two, something blocks our path. I'll, I'll hop out. Uh, <laughs> Barnacle, watch the crate. Barnacle, uh, of course, will watch the crate, though they look to be about half asleep right now. <laughs> All right, well, good job, Barnacle. All right, Carly, At least one eye, that's all we ask. <laughs> I will pop out. Um, so you said... This what was this creature called? A Strix wolf. Strix wolf, um, adult-ish size. Oh yeah, like you could potentially ride it if you wanted to. Okay, interesting. Eating eating a thing. Can we tell what it is? What is this feasting upon? Uh, not from this distance. You would have to get closer. All right. How how big is the merchant cart? 
Uh, the one that's blocking the road, it is about the same size as yours, so you will have to f either clear the cart from the road or go off the path into the forest to get around it. Okay. Um, I'd like to like put my hands up peacefully and try to like move a little around to the left, see if there's any survivors under the cart, if anyone is hiding from the Strick Wolf that is on top of the cart eating something. Kind of get a gauge for the situation here. Okay. So we're going to do a roll here, but I am going to give you a little bit of information before the roll. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be able to tell as you approach that they do appear to be chewing on what looks to be a severed hand uh, belonging okay. to a human. And you also note that kind of clumsily picking over the cart are these two little Strix Wolf, just these small little pups that are kind of looking between their food, their mother, and you respectively. So what we're going to do is we're going to do our very first roll. And the main core mechanic in Daggerheart is a series of 2d12 rolls for the players. One of these d12 is called the Hope Die. The other d12 is called the Fear Die. And what happens is we roll those two together, add any relevant modifiers, and compare that against a value threshold to see if you pass or succeed. Now, you might be wondering, ELH, well, why are we rolling two different D12s and calling them different things? Well, if you roll with hope, which means that your hope die is higher than your fear die, then your roll is with hope. And that leads to uh, taking a meta currency known as hope. That leads to yes ands, uh, no buts. You know, it's a good thing to roll with hope. Um, if you roll with fear, though, I get meta currency. The GM gets meta currency. And you can still succeed, but roll with fear. And it'll make more sense once we start playing. So, Garrick, since I think you're in the lead here, if you could roll the macro, and if you could go ahead and add your presence to this roll. Okay, how would we feel about affable being an experience here? Uh, that would be good, but if I remember correctly, you have to spend a hope to do it. I Yes, that is correct. I would like to add that. Okay. So I will spend one of my two starting hope. Roll my die. Okay. Let me... Uh, so you roll with hope, and you've obtained and then, a 23 plus... What is it? One, two? Minus one to presence, and then plus two because of affable. So 24 total. 24. More than sufficient. Yeah. So the Mother Strix Wolf does kind of look towards you and maybe does like one or two steps towards you, and it's sniffing... And its tail wags a bit. And then right before you can really get within touching distance, it kind of reels back. And then it kind of lets out this trill. And you know, based on that trill, that there might be other Strix within the area. But they're not like, hey, hunting call, come hunt these humans. Um, this is more just kind of a, if that makes any sense. Okay, okay, just just a hey, there's stuff over here. Okay. Interesting. Um But they big. do appear to not be hostile. They seem like if you move forward, they'll get out of the way, maybe kind of go to the side of the road, but doesn't appear that they're hostile for the moment. So Marlo okay. has a class feature called Arcane Sense. It just says she can sense the presence of magical people and objects when she's close to them. Um, would she happen to sense anything in the area around the cart? I think she'd probably approach a little behind Garrick and Kavi just to see if she could sense anything. An interesting question. Do you have to spend anything, or is it this like a passive effect? Oh, it seems to be passive. Okay. It just says I sense the presence. It says no other details. Right. And I'm just saying if there is anything here in the cart here. You're not sensing anything magical in the cart or the immediate area based on what I'm reading here. Interesting. However, um, as you all do get closer to the merchant cart, you do see that uh, there is a dead driver, uh, a human, middle-aged, and what you notice is that his neck has been slit. Ooh. Ooh, that's not good. They ran into a bit of trouble here. Yeah, I guess seeing that the Strix Wolves are uh, not hostile, I'll, I'll move back to the cart by Marlo and, uh, and Kari. It's like, uh, it looks like um, Merchant was killed by a blade, not a, not a Strix Wolf. 
so uh i guess we what we want to do just uh skirt around it and continue on or i think it is best if we continue on our mission perhaps scare off the beast so we can continue right, we'll see what we can do about clearing out this cart too uh, well, yeah, we can check it for uh, any sort of provisions or supplies or whatnot. Well, I meant more just move it out of the way. Uh, we, we can pocket stuff while we do that. Kari's going to just give him a knowing look. <laughs> Curious, though, who would slit the throat of a fruit merchant? Why waste the effort? Maybe he was peddling more than just fruit. Um, Marlo, since you seem to be the one that's paying the most attention to your surroundings, can you give me an instinct roll here? So go ahead and do your hope and fear die and add whatever your instinct is. A critical success, and I'm glad you roll that because this is a teaching moment. So one of the things I actually really like about this system is that if you roll the same number on your hope and your fear die, no matter what it is, even if it's natural ones, you attain a critical success. And a critical success is a big thing in this system. In fact, it's one of those things where you get a number of benefits for getting it. So uh, Josh, you get to take a hope. You get to clear stress, which I don't think you have any. And... If this was an attack, you would have done extra damage, but this is just a, a noticing your surroundings. Um, which, again, I'm going to make a note here for anybody paying attention. There are not rules for critical successing on this instinct rule, but I'm going to give them a little bit extra because of critical success. So what you're going to notice, Marlo, is that there are eyes watching you from the darkness beyond the trail. So in kind of among the trees, you notice that there's eyes watching you. And what you also notice is that there's these remnants of thorny bramble that are kind of tangled around the wheel of the carriage that then trail off into that same direction of those watching eyes. Okay. So Marlo also has a class feature called Minor Illusion, mm-hmm. uh, where she can roll a spell cast, and if she, she's, if she succeeds, she can create a Minor Illusion no larger than herself within close range that is convincing to anyone in far range or further. So I think what she'd like to do is maybe make it look like the cart's on fire. Hopefully, what she's going for is whatever is in the forest, whatever may have actually done this, she wants to scare them away. She's not looking for a conflict, really. She just wants to keep going. So she just kind of wants to avoid any kind of confrontation that might be here. So hopefully she's thinking if you make the, the wagon catch it immediately in flames, maybe that'll scare them away. Okay, I like it. Uh, for your spell, is there a particular DC? Because I know for spell casting, sometimes it gives you the DC on the card itself. Yeah, it says spell cast 10. Okay, so then you have to get a 10 or better. Okay, could I use one of my hopes to um, spend, or to use an experience? Uh, I'd like the experience to be not on my watch. I'll allow it. So that's a plus one. Uh, I think her spell casting stat is instinct, so it would be a plus three total with my experience. Okay, let's see what happens. Another yeah, critical a success. Oh, wow. wow. All right. Well, so you conjure up this, this illusion of the cart catching fire. And what I'm curious, is this like a like a bonfire blaze? Is this a noticeably magical blaze? Like, was this something where Marlo kind of thrust out their hand and kind of a an energy shot out to sell the illusion? Like, what, what does that look like exactly? I mean, for the critical success, I'm going to say it's probably very, very dramatic in that she probably bursts in flames in the illusion first, and then she holds out her hand, and the cart itself, and the flame extends out of her hand to the cart, and the cart catches up in a blaze as well. And it's probably not a small flame. It's probably like this large purple flame that's over the height of the trees sort of thing. I imagine it's that dramatic. Wow. Okay. And the trees are very tall, so that is even more of a dramatic flame. I love it. So... I have to think, because again, you got a critical success. I want to empower you here. So here's what's going to happen. Those eyes that you noticed in the trees, you notice about half of them pull away. There's maybe two that remain. So there were about six or seven. There's now just two that remain. And the rest of you, 
uh, after seeing Marlo suddenly catch fire and light the cart on fire, quote unquote, um, you all hear the sounds of a branch snapping from the tree line and coming out from the underbrush are two thistle folk. Now, thistle folk, as far as I read, are some form of a brigand or some form of kind of a treant mixed with a human, as far as I read. But they're also wielding daggers and wearing armor uh, made of polished stone. And we are going to enter into our very first combat to see how Fine. combat works here. Okay. Um, what I would say, though, is that had you, since you got the critical successes, you not only foiled their ambush, and you also scared away about a good amount of them. So, okay, nice. Um, Sweet. And this is another thing I'm going to make a note of, that there should be a way to avoid this encounter. But again, I know why they're pushing the encounter, because they want to be sure, a sample sure. of combat. Yeah. There, there needs to be something in here for future play tests, like, hey, if they roll a critical success, do this. Um, mm -hmm. Makes sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to enter into combat. And one thing I love about the combat in the system is it's very similar to things like Star Trek Adventures and Fallout and other sort of narrative first systems where there's not a set turn order. In fact, one person could go multiple times in a row if they so wished. There is no, okay, you've went, okay, now we go to you, okay, then we go to you. I might still do that just so everybody gets a chance to contribute, but mm -hmm. technically, as I said, you could act back-to-back -back no problem. The caveat to that, though, is that every time you act, we tick up the action tracker. And the action tracker is just basically a, a part to put tokens on. And after a action tracker uh, goes up to a certain amount, um, I can use those points to activate NPCs. Um, but I'll explain that more in the moment. Uh, what matters is you see these two thistle folk coming at you very warily. They're looking at the cart and Marlow, and they're not really sure at the make of you, but they are at least brave enough to confront you. And my question is, who among you would like to act first? Uh, <clears throat> so I, this is one of those we can tell reasonably that these things are hostile and tend to be hostile. Oh yeah, folk, they have daggers they're just out. Humans, they're just humans with branches, right? I, I'm, I'm th uh, sort of, yeah. So if, you, if you've if you ever played World of Warcraft, do you remember uh, the druid oh, healing yeah. form, the tree? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, okay. Kind of like Copy. that. Copy, perfect. Yeah. I see it in my mind's eye, okay. Um, and they're not running away, they're, they're sticking around, right? Yeah, just the two of them though. Um, well, I mean, you know, we, we're on a mission. We're protecting the, protecting the crate. So, I mean, also Marlo did try to put up a very like, impressive display to scare them away. And these are the ones that made it through it. So they're probably very determined to come at us. Yeah. These guys, these guys have some resolve. What, uh, what distance are they still at? I would say that they are at, uh, what is it? Far range. Let me quickly okay. confirm. They are at because one of the other things that the system does is it doesn't necessarily require a map uh it does use range brands and ah here it is i found it on my sheet uh actually they are at close range so they're at the very edge of close range so about 30 feet away oh, okay gotcha okay so i mean garrick or, or kavi unless you all would respond immediately i know marlo would immediately attack like she had been watching them in the forest she tried to scare them off She's moving to the next stage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want to, if you want to go ahead and take the initiative, I think you were the one that that knew of their presence, so it, it tracks for you to you to act first. So, so yeah, Marlo's I'm, carrying... I'm imagining them being caught, you know, kind of by surprise by the fire. Yeah. It wasn't announced, so Kari's like, you know, jump back a little bit. Yeah, then... I'm fully convinced that the cart's on fire. I right, that's magic. The same. Huh? I'm like, oh yeah. my, you know, I'm gonna get burned. So and then <laughs> right, that's crazy. The, the creatures. <laughs> yeah. I, I so, think this is sort of Marlo's vibe too. She she kind of reads on the character sheet as someone who's very intense. So I think she's probably like, yeah, she's going right for it. Nice. I love it. All right. So what would you like to do? Yeah. So Marlo carries a wooden staff. It's described as a dual staff, which in my mind, I think is a staff that has like a purple crystal. Like I think purple is her color. So I think she's got like a purple crystal on top 
And I think what she does is she immediately takes it and points it at one of them, and the fire that had been around her maybe had lingered a bit in some places, but it catches in this crystal and zaps at one of them. So the trait is instinct, which is my, my good trait, and the, the range is far, so I'm assuming if they're closer to far, I can still shoot yeah, them? You should be able to still hit them. Okay. Uh, so I am going to do that roll. I'm also, if I don't do well, or if I do well, I want to be better, I also have a card that's called Primal Origin that I can spend uh, stress to make uh, either extend the range, add it to the result, hit a second target, or reroll damage dice. So we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I am guess I'm going to just roll my instinct and see what happens. Okay, let's see what happens. And I'll, I'll explain more of this after the roll, just so people looking at home. All right, a 12. Interesting. Uh, that's actually not enough to hit either target. Could I, if I had plus two... Well, I guess I have to actually do it, and you tell me if I hit or not. So I would like to mark a stress to add plus two to this roll. Okay, that will be enough. Um, and what I would say, just so people at home understand what's going on, so there's kind of three hit uh, hit point trackers in the system. There is actual HP, which is a number different for everybody else at the table. There's stress, which is kind of like a lesser version of HP, and then there's armor, but we'll get into that once damage starts happening. Um, so one thing I'm going to ask, though, Josh, is that Marlo, would she attack the one wielding the dagger or the one that looks to be a little bit more wrapped in cloth? Which one's closer? Uh, I would say the one with the dagger. I think mean, that's the one she's going for then. She's, gonna, she's going for the one that seems to be the most aggressive. Okay, so go ahead and roll your damage dice on this. So that's 1d8 plus 2. Okay, total of 6. Now, just as kind of a transparent thing, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put how much damage they've taken in chat. And one thing, again, I like about this system is that there is kind of one-shot protection to some degree. Um, so, for example, uh, the Thistle Folk Ambusher that you're attacking... Um, it has thresholds of 1, 6, and 10, which means if you do 1 or more damage, they take 1 HP. If you do 6 or more damage, they take 2 HP. If you do 10 or more damage, they take 3 HP. So you have done 6 damage, meaning that you have hit them for 2 HP. So what does that look like? Uh, is it the same sort of fire that you illusion you, uh, that you made as an illusion? Is it a different kind of chaotic magic? What, what, what does that look like? I think it's that purple flame that shot out of the end of her staff. It hits them, and maybe, um, maybe the the maybe it's less like a a small flame. Maybe it's more like a glow that encompasses them very quickly. Okay, and then fades away. Got it. Got it. I like it. So kind of like a uh, sacred flame from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Nice. I like it. All right. So again, you didn't roll with fear, so it is still the player's turn. So you could act again. It could go to Garrick. It could go to Kyrie. What would you, you know? Just kind of open open conversation. Who wants to go next? Or right, you can uh, take a chop at him. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So yeah, upon seeing them, she'll take out her battle axe that she had on her back. You know, kind of look at them, and uh, you said everything was close range, right? Yes. So she's going to uh, uh, take a swing at them. Now, the battle axe mentions that she has very close range and close range. Mm -hmm. So how how close do I have to be for the very close range? Uh, you would have to be within, uh, let me check. You would have to be within five or ten feet for very close. But one of the things is... Since there's nothing hindering your movement to get up close to them, you can just move up to very close with them. Okay. I'm now, if go something, ahead and do that then. mostly just so everybody knows, if there is something that could hinder your movement, like you're engaged with somebody in melee, you would have to roll an agility to make that move, if that makes sense. Okay. So then she's going to go ahead and swing with her battle axe and. If successful, uh, it's going to use her whirlwind ability. Okay. So the role here, as far as experience goes, she has not afraid of anything. Okay. And Remember, then it would just be... Hope. 
right? And then her just her strength of two on top of that. Okay, setting you up for success. All right, so that is a total of 17, but you have rolled with fear. So that means that after we resolve this, it will be my turn, and I also get a fear on top of that. But yeah, go ahead and let's resolve your attack, and then we'll keep going. So the question is, what does Whirlwind do out of curiosity? When I make a successful attack, the melee in very close range, I spend a hope. I'm going to take away one now. I'm down to one hope. Mm -hmm. And I can roll against every other enemy in the weapons range. Okay. Any additional enemies you succeed against with this ability take half damage. Round it up. Okay, so I think that means you do have to roll again, just to make sure you hit them. Okay, you will miss, and I will get another fear token from that. Interesting. All it's right. that fire, she's afraid. Yeah, it's all that fire. But yeah, uh, what is the damage on your attack? Okay, so it's going to be 1d10 plus 4. Okay. Oh, you did one D zero. So okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> he did one D zero plus four. Ah, yeah. I was like, that's not possible on a D ten. Yeah. I, in fact, I was mildly impressed. <laughs> right, right. There we go. An eleven. Excellent. So, uh, Squiff, why don't you describe how Kyrie takes out the thistle folk and uh, thistle folk ambusher for us? So she's just kind of grinning, you get this big grin, and she just starts packing away and just swinging wildly. And the whole time, she's she's basically uh, almost singing out loud, "I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay." Nice. <laughs> I love it. So you you slice down, you cleave the thistle folk ambusher, and they go down hard. And one thing that I like that they actually ask uh, in this this quick start: Are you knocking them out? Are you killing them? Like, it, I, are you being lethal or non lethal? Is is the question here? She is is being lethal. Yeah, lethal. absolutely. Okay. Perfectly valid. All right. So, since fear has been rolled, it now comes to the GM side. Now, normally what would have to happen is I would have to spend fear, or it would have to be a dramatically mom or dramatic moment in the fiction for me to take back control. But for this, uh, I have to spend, if I understand this correctly, I have to spend one of the action tracker to move, uh, the Thistle Folk Thief, and I have to spend one fear to activate their special ab ability. So that will bring me down to three fear and one on the action tracker. So what's going to happen is Kyrie, the remaining thistle folk, the one with kind of the, the extra cloth on them, is going to hold out a hand, uh, kind of like, um, what's his name? Iron Fist from Marvel, where his <laughs> hand, the palm of his hand glows, and then he's going to slam it into you uh, to make an attack against you. So what is your evasion? My evasion is five. All right. So one thing that is different for GMs is that GMs only roll D20s unless they're rolling damage. So the players are always 2D12. The GM is always 1D20. So let's see what happens. I believe a 22 hits you. I just, I, I have wow. a feeling. Wow. Yeah. So let me see. This will deal this much damage. All right. So we'll do nine damage to you. And now is when we have to start talking about things like armor. So remember that thing I said earlier about how armor is kind of like an HP track. So what you can do, for example, is Kyrie, you have taken nine damage here, but you have seven armor. So what you could do here is you can mark one box of your armor and you would reduce that nine to two. Yeah, I'm going to do that because it'll bring it down to minor. Got it. Actually, it's below minor because your threshold is an eight. 
So okay. you would only mark stress here instead of marking a hit point. Does it be two stress or just one? Just one. Okay. Got but the, the dramatic effect to all this is that the strike of the palm sends you hurtling head over heels over the illusory fire uh, to far range on the other side of the cart from everybody. Oh, so shit. kind of like a, a blast back, as it were. Nice. And yeah, uh, I'm going to turn things back over to the players. Again, anyone can go, but I'm going to look especially at Garrick for now. Yeah, seeing seeing Kari get get flung backwards, I'll um, I'll, I'll draw draw my longsword and and rush rush into melee range, and uh, try to try to get rid of the threat. I like it. Um, all right, so duality die. My longsword is plus three, so two from agility, and then one because of reliable, which is a thing that the longsword has. Mm -hmm. All right, so you take a hope. With hope. Fifteen is all enough. Right. <clears throat> cool. And then damage is a d8 plus one. S solid. Wow. <laughs> wow. Nice. Oof. All right, so you get a small hit on them. What does that look like? Um, yeah, I, I go in and I'm trying to uh, trying to use my agility to get a nice, nice, quick slash on them. But this this uh, this thistle folk is pretty quick as well and uh, kind of dodges a bit. So it's it's just kind of a glancing blow, just kind of grazing the shoulder a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna put it in the tracker so everybody can see it at home. But you do graze it. You do cause a little bit of damage to this Thistlefolk thief. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately spend two yeah. fear to take control of the, the, the narrative at the moment. And I'm also going to spend another fear because they're going to they're going to glowing fist palm you, too, because <laughs> nice, it's interesting. Nice. Yeah. So uh, what is your evasion? Nine. Nine. All right. Plus three. Well, I believe that is a six, which misses you completely. There you go. So would that have been something where you dodged out of the way? Did you knock it away with your sword? What does that look like? Yeah, knowing knowing that that seems to be its kind of punch maneuver, um, I'm I'm expecting them to do the same thing. So I'm kind of push myself into even close range so they they don't have a good angle to punch me at. I kind of just push past them, just right up in his face. Hello. Okay. All right, I like it. And yeah, we now return to the players. I have no more fear remaining. There's only one thing on the action tracker. The Thistlefolk Thief looks like if you gave it a good whack, it might expire. So who would like to go next? Now, can I, I do a thing here to grapple it for no damage, to hold it in a position that makes it easier for Molo to shoot it? And this is I where it gets tricky. So... I think rules is written. That would be a tag team move, I think. Uh, but let me see oh, if I can clarify that. I have a bad idea, you all, and tell me if you think this is silly. I was thinking Marlo might try to talk to this thing at this point, because I think she realizes that we've kind of removed the threat, but she might also be kind of interested in why this thing is coming at them. Or we could just kill it. I don't know. I could go with that. I mean, that's totally fine. I can, I can maybe try to. Oh, I, I have this thing where I can. Like deal damage to something if I grapple it. So maybe I can try to grapple it and knock it out, and then and then we can try to talk with it. I don't I don't know, but yeah, oh, I, don't, tell I don't think that's a bad idea. I like the idea. I mean, I imagine Kari's closing on the range now, you know, so she right. might look threatening coming back in with her battle axe. If you want to try to negotiate now. Yeah, I think I think it's worth it if if you all are if you all are cool with it. I think Marlo would. Yeah. She would try to make a dramatic display about it where. You know, she waves her staff, and the flame from the car just goes out. Just cast, getting rid of the minor illusion, if that's cool. It doesn't say anything about that, so I imagine I could just end it at will. Yep. And then she stamps the the staff down to the ground, and she says, "In the best Gandalf that she can, creature, we mean you no harm. Why do you fight us so fiercely?" Hey, go ahead, and I believe this would be a presence on your part. Okay. Can I use? A, oh, I think I need to. I need to. And to charge this up a little bit, I'd like to use a hope and use my experience royal mage. Mm -hmm. So how I'm hoping this would apply is that she's a royal mage, apparently of some kind of renown or influence to 
to a king that maybe she has uh, a presence here that she can kind of project to this creature. Maybe it would understand that this is what she is. I like it. I like it a lot. Go ahead and add that plus two to your roll. Okay, so I'm rolling a plus three total. Okay. With ten. fear. Yeah. It is with fear, so I actually do get a fear for that. Yeah. So let me look, because again, the quick start doesn't have rules for this, but that'll just be something I note later. Let's see. Yeah, I think basically based on the fact that you made the illusion, you dispatched his buddy pretty easily, this would have been an easy roll. So since an easy threshold is 10, you just got it. Like, just got it. Oh, nice. So the Thistle Folk Thief is going to kind of drop his uh, drop his extra weapons that he was keeping concealed within his cloth armor. And he'll say something to the effect of, I, I was just doing a job that we were instructed to do. We, we were told that a cart would be coming through here with something very powerful and worth stealing. And who exactly hired you? And you can see that they want to tell you, but it's one of those things that they're also not only in fear of you, but in fear of the person who told them this. Keep in mind, whoever hired you is not your friend. They've already cost the life of one of your compatriots. What more do you have to give this person? You raise an excellent point. If you must know, in the valley or in the town of Hush, there is a dwarf. I don't know her name, but there is a dwarf that approached us one day and offered us some coin. I see, and did they tell you what to do with the crate once you had secured it? Uh, they gave us a spot in the forest to leave it, and that she would come and pick it up. If you tell us where in the forest and when the exchange was to happen, we will let you go in peace. All right. They give you those details. Uh, it's oh. if you like, so if you pull out your map of Sablewood and you look where Hush is and look where this location is, it's about like a, a two hour walk into the forest itself to this clearing where the handoff was supposed to take place. And the handoff was actually supposed to take place about two or three hours from now, which would track with your coming through this portion of the sable. Interesting. And I think Marla would look to Garrick, not only for to, to release the creature, but also kind of get to get Garrick's approval. Like, am I doing this right? Should we really let this thing go or should we just kill it? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like give a shrug and eh. it's, it's, it's one little dude and I'll, uh, I'll kind of pat him on the back and, and, Keep keep his weapons just in case he has any smart ideas. Like I was uh, a pleasure doing business with you, friend. I'm sorry about the uh, the, the other one, but uh, have a good one. Um, but I'll walk over to the group and be like, so we don't we don't really know what's in there, but apparently it's um something rather important. Then hmm? if uh, folks are Hiding to get it. The king told it was imp told us it was important. That is all we need to know. I think it best that we get to the town as quickly as possible to make our delivery. Uh, definitely in agreement there. Kavi, are all you right. injured? I'm okay. You can give me a hand with this cart, though, Garrick, and we'll get it out of the way. I'll happily help. So just because I don't think that this is going to be a rollable thing, because uh, one thing the, the rules do stress is that rolls should matter. Like it's not in Star mm, Trek where you throw out like difficulties, your rolls to get the momentum like they're doing it because they don't want you to game the hope system, which kind of makes sense. But at the same time, I would probably make a note that it's probably a good idea to throw out checks like that. So your players do have hope. Um, yeah, but, but we're going to play it as much as rules is written. Mm -hmm. So you move the cart out of the way. You're able to get back on your own carriage and get going to hush the village proper. And as the path leads you further into the forest, you eventually come upon this large stone pillar. And on the top, uh, actually carved from top to bottom, are these ancient dwarven symbols. 
And Marlo, you would know this based on your uh, magical sensing ability, that this is one of the wards that keeps the village of Hush safe. And these wards are kind of set at compass position, so north, south, east, west. And when you pass beyond this stone marker, all of you feel this very small sensation like the pop of a bubble. And then you start to hear sounds from the village. So your entire approach to the village, just quiet, normal forest sounds. You push past the stone pillar. Now you can hear the sounds of chatter and people within the village. Huh. Do we see the residents of the village? Are they mostly dwarves or are they other races that we might know? Uh, they are a large mix. Uh, there's humans, there's dwarves, there's clank, and clanks are kind of like, kind of like, uh, what are they called in D&D? &D? Automatons. Um, automatons or, uh, God, why can't I remember what they're called? Josh, I, I'm blanking. What is Guardian? Autonomes? One? Not autonomes. Uh, uh, I know exactly what you're thinking of. Yeah, I just blanked two on it. Either way, um, they're automatons. Oh, well, Warforged. Warforged, yes. Yeah, yeah, I was Thank like, you. I was like, Ward something? Yeah, put three GMs together, we'll eventually... <laughs> we'll remember. figure it out, we'll get there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just know, um, this is why we need you. So, there's clanks, there's dwarves, there's humans, uh, there's actually some fairies as well. You see some fairies. Uh, there are some cat folk. Uh, I believe the cat folk in this are called... What are they called? Uh, they are called, uh, Katari, actually. So you're seeing some Katari as well. And there's a wide variety of genders on display as well. So it's not just, oh, they're all male dwarves or all female dwarves or all other dwarves. Like, mm -hmm. you have nothing to go on, unfortunately, when it comes to the supposed dwarf that hired the thistle folk. Okay, yeah, I was hoping there would be like one female dwarf and we could point our finger at it and say, hey, you, but obviously not. Unfortunately not. And that actually is uh, because you rolled with fear. Um, so you got the information that somebody had hired them, but you only got limited information. So you still got a success, but it wasn't as great as it could have been. My friends, do you think after we deliver the crate, should we go into the forest and see if we can encounter whoever hired uh, the thistle folk to attack us? We... From what I can tell, we'd have some time. I'm sure we could have a word or two with them. We could. Um, what we, uh, I guess we, we can't take the cart into the woods. Not easily, at least. Um, can't leave the crate unattended, of course. Yes, yeah, so best, of course, to complete our mission. And, and deliver the crate to the, the White Fire Arcanist. And, Elish, I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. would Marlo have reasonable cause to know who this White Fire Ar Arcanist is? That is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you roll with knowledge here? Oh, uh, boy. See, this is actually funny because Marlo is not really great at this. Even though she is a lore-born elf, her knowledge right. skill is zero. Right. Does she have a card, perhaps, that might give her a bonus? No, actually, she... Oh, no, she does have advantage on any roles that deal with history, culture, or politics of a prominent person or place. So if the Whitefire Arcanus is prominent, perhaps... Yeah, I would actually give you advantage. And what I would say is you're rolling that, make sure you hit the advantage button. But for the people at home, um, if you have advantage on a roll, you add a d6 to it. Right. <laughs> so maybe not maybe right. not so what is that you rolled what a well wow okay so you rolled well, a four a two hope. and a two okay interesting so you did get a hope so you are going to succeed uh it is enough the the dc was only a five so you do get a hope and a success here um and what you would know is that the white fire canist is a old fairy that is somewhere nearby hush but that she's very reclusive and sometimes moves her home around so if you want to fire or find or figure out where she is currently you're gonna have to ask around town tavern 
easy sell. Everybody likes chatting in taverns. Everybody loves it. String 101. But th- this would it'd be hard to hear. It's a hush tech. That's true. I got to get my voice down. <laughs> well, one thing I would say is that as you're kind of debating your options is that the kind of distinctive safe and comforting air. So kind of outside that barrier, again, that sort mm-hmm. of hush silence, but inside the barrier protecting the, t- the town, there's a warm comfort air. Uh, a few people at this point have kind of smiled and waved at you, seeing your newcomers. Um, you hear the sound of lively music drifting from a nearby tavern at the center of town. And actually, a clank is going to approach you. And they say he should be soft-spoken. I say no, he should be bombastic. Nice. So <laughs> this clank will kind of hold out a hand and go, Ah, oh, uh, greetings. I see that you are newcomers to Hush. Uh, my name is Fives. How might I be of assistance to you? Well, Fives, let me let me tell you, what an absolute pleasure to meet you. Uh, Gary Reed, how you doing? I'll shake his hand, give him a pat on the back. Mm-hmm. I'll, he'll eagerly shake your hand. This is a this is a lovely little place you got here. What's what's your role here? Oh, I am just uh, you know, standard person living here, nothing of important. Uh well, I I must admit I do help in the bakery, but uh, nothing important. But are, are you perhaps here for the first frost mo- for- first for All right, hold on. This Take is your time, Fives. I'm here with you. Look at me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the first most festival. Are you here for that? You betcha. That sounds great. Super exciting. You Marlo no kind of looks at Fives for a second and she says, yes, perhaps we are. But um, Fives, as you say, we're actually here to meet with the Whitefire Arcanist. Um, have you heard of her? I, uh, I do, yes. Uh, and he kind of looks at you with a different kind of eye. Like before he was very personal. He's still personal, but now he's kind of wary. He's like, uh... What is your business with uh, with our chemist? Uh, she is she is interesting person. I would say our business is our own, but our mission is of utmost importance. And he's going to kind of think it over and goes, "All right, uh, I'm going to take it on faith that you're not here to cause trouble. Uh, I don't know personally where our our chemist is, but." Uh, if we go to the tavern, uh, I'm sure that we'll be able to find someone that can help. Indeed, thank you. And then, yeah, um, he'll kind of motion for you to follow, and if you want to follow him, he'll take you right to the tavern. Yeah, might, might as well. Do we want to leave this cart unattended, though? And Marla looks very nervous about that and she says this is a this is where i will have to trust you my friends in the tavern it's a definitely not my kind of arena and there's no way i can leave this crate unattended i trust you all could to find out any information about the arcanist while i stay behind perhaps and and watch the crate oh no worries we'll rub we'll rub some elbows we'll uh we'll figure it out how how big is this crate l uh, I would say it's something that you would have to lift as a pair. Even you being a giant, you would have to lift it as a pair. Okay. And yeah, Shizno, if you're here, go ahead and roll on in and we'll get Barnacle introduced. Because that might actually provide a way to, for someone to uh, watch the card. Yeah, it's true. Oh, th- Hello, th- Shizno. How are you doing? There he is. Oh, you know... Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, that could. But yeah, uh, since this is you first appearing on screen, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and who you're playing? I am Sleepy Shizno, uh, the one who does not uh, program alarms correctly. Nice. And uh, I am playing Barnacle, who uh, has a higher intellect than me at the moment. So uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. You can lean into the character. <laughs> it's the vibe. <laughs> Nice. Oh. But uh what is Barnacle? What uh what 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 is their heritage? Oh yeah, I am an underborn ribbit 
And I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a rogue. Ah, okay. Interesting. All right, so uh, Barnacle, you have been asleep this entire time, funnily enough, and you've just woken up. You appear to be in a forest village of some kind. Uh, with you is Marlo, Garrick, and Kyrie. And uh, they seem to be being led towards a tavern, or at least some of them anyway, towards a tavern uh, for some reason. But you are just waking up. You have no idea what's going on. Perfect. This is why uh, I do character acting. I, I get right into the method acting. <laughs> Love it. Just gonna, just gonna look at everyone like, hi. She's no. So Marlo is kind of a jerk. So apologies in advance. But Marlo turns around and she kicks you and she says, Barnacle, you worthless creature, it's time to earn your keep. Okay, hi. <laughs> I'm just, just waking up. So it sounds like Kermit the Frog. Okay. I love Garrick it. and Kavi need your help. They're going to enter the tavern here and see if they can find out any information as to the whereabouts of the White, the white Fire Arcanist. I believe this is a particular place where your expertise will be very valuable. He gives you a salute. You're like, I, Barnacle of the clan of Kerr, will do this. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Please remember to not give up too much information. It's also very important that we deliver this to the White Fire Arcanist within two hours if possible. We have another appointment to keep, I should say. Now, Ellis, we entered this mm -hmm. village, this bubble that's around Hush. Is, mm -hmm. is that something that's unusual for a town to have? Or being nomadic, has Kari come across that before? That's a good question. Uh, roll me a knowledge. That's going to be with a plus one. Okay, so I actually get a fear off that, but it is still a success with a fear. So, yeah, actually, you would know that this is a form of warding and that uh, anything that is within a dangerous area or things like very, very large cities or castles, they will have these sort of wards set up to help protect from the natural evils of the world. So things like the thistle folk, things like undead spirits, things like that. So kind of imagine it like... um. Not quite a concentra concentration, I think is the word I want. Um, but it is kind of like a barrier that helps protect local areas. Hmm. Okay, like circle of protection are pretty common. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, with that, uh, Ari is just going to start trundling off towards the tavern. All right. So if I have it correctly, Marlo, you're staying with the cart. Everybody else is going to the Clover Tavern. Do I have that right? Yep. I, I think Marlo is. I think Marlo's probably going to sit right next to the cart. Like she's not even going to get it out of her sight. She's she's very focused on her mission. Okay. Yeah, right. Marlo can make the uh, illusion, right? Yes, yeah, she can. Maybe while you're guarding that cart, you could make an illusion of the the crate. Because that'd be about the same size, right? Is it no larger than myself? The crate, yeah, you could, uh, you could make the crate look like something else, or not even be there at all with the illusion. Yeah, why don't I try that? And then if, man, I don't know if she would even leave it. Then I think she might still even stay if it's invisible. She's, she, she strikes me as just not even trusting of of illusions. Like she's very focused on this mission. But yeah, let's see what happens. Um. So yeah, I'm rolling an instinct, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, so hope, but she did not succeed. Her difficulty was a 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you still get a hope, but no success here. So the you try to make the illusion and this nothing happens. Your magic fails you in this moment. It even extended too that maybe there's something going on with this whatever inside the crate that's blocking her illusion somehow. Potentially. <laughs> but she She's going to look a little, maybe downtrodden to the rest of you. And you can tell that maybe she was actually hoping to be able to make the crate disappear so she could go on the fun times, but she's not going to walk away now. 
Like this is her mission. She's got to protect it. You got to commit to the bit. Yeah. Yep. All right. In that case, let us adjourn to the Clover Tavern. So the Clover Tavern itself is actually a very interesting building. It kind of has six curving stories that have been kind of carved into this trunk of an ancient tree. So very elven in design. Um, But this is very obviously the heart of the community here in Hush, where it's always crowded, there's always music, there's always good-natured conversation, and the drink and tales flow uh, flow freely. Now, one thing, as the three of you come into the Clover Tavern, your friend Fives turns to you and goes, Ah, there is tradition here at Clover Tavern. You see the line above the door? You are to leave your shoes there, and you will collect them when you leave. It is tradition here. That's a fun tradition, as long as someone doesn't take my boots, but they're uh, pretty muddy and dirty anyway, so yeah, I'll happily leave them up there. I don't care. Oh, then you are in good luck, because your shoes will be returned shined and filled with small little trinkets of appreciation. Oh, that's cool. Um, I, I, don't, I don't wear shoes. I just plop plop. Joe. And I think Clank looks down at you, Barnacle, and goes, Ah, I am seeing problem, but do not worry. I We have situation for this. And uh, what happens is right within the threshold of the Clover Tavern, there's these like little booties that you would use for like children or babies. And uh, Fives hangs that up in the line and goes, there you go. Now you are participating as well. That's that's a very cool tradition, Fives. That's that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. But uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps I should be introducing you to Barkeep, who might be able to help us. Before Kari puts hers up, she's just going to kind of glance around and ensure that everybody else in the tavern is shoeless. <laughs> it's not some, like, cultural prank. Um, I would say that it's not that everybody else is shoeless. There are some people with shoes, but it's not just your shoes that are on this line above the door. There are like probably about five or six other pairs of shoes that are on this line. Okay. All right. Now, one thing I am going to ask is what about this tavern is perhaps unnatural than the other taverns you've been in so far. And I like how they're doing this. They're baking it into the adventure, trying to get the table involved in telling the tale. Um, So I'm just, again, going to do an open question. What makes this tavern look so exotic or feel so different than other taverns you've been in? We're inside a tree, right? Sorry, say again? We're inside a, a tree, essentially. Yes, you're inside one of those giant pink redwoods. Okay. Oh, okay. One of those. I would say that along the inner walls of this place are almost vine-like, um, you know, just vines kind of running across that are the same color as the blossoms outside, and they're giving off a, an ambient light. Oh, so they're bioluminescent. I like it. Neat. All right. Next question I have for you. What unique smell permeates the air? Feet. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Do you want that to be your final answer? Yeah, why not? You're in a tree, you know, we're vibing. All right. So there is kind of that earthy dirt smell that kind of permeates the air then. I love it. Um, Next question is what is the difference between the first and the second floor? Because when Fives leads you to the bartender, he actually leads you up a staircase Mm. built into the solid center of the trunk that remains. So what is different about the second floor from the first? How many many floors is it total? Five. I think it would be cool if, like, six. I think it would be cool if, like, the the stairs leading from the second to the third floor are not normal stairs. They're kind of that that bioluminescent vine substance has kind of crafted pseudo stairs there um, to be kind of a bit more natural, uh, natural climb up. I like it. I like it. All right. So in the second and as, floor, as you step on them, they, they light up. Yeah, there oh. you go. 
I like it. So they light up when you when you touch them. I like it. And again, this is one thing I think that the the playtest is doing well so far is it's it's bringing you all in and asking you to contribute instead of the usual D&D thing of, oh, you see this. It looks like this. Roll perception. You get this. I like this a lot more. Um, yeah. But yeah, where was I? Yes. So um, on the second floor, uh, you are led to a bar and the bar kind of does a ring around that center trunk. And at the bar is a older woman, uh, a dwarf, and an older man, also a dwarf. And uh, the woman uh, gets Fives attention for, or Fives gets her attention first and goes, uh, uh, y- yes, Stalwin, Stalwin, yes, hello, I, I bring new friends. And uh, Stalwin kind of squints her eyes at you and you can tell that she's an older dwarf and uh, she has a very thick beard and uh, she has to actually put down a barrel of ale that she was carrying back and forth. And she kind of squints and goes, Ah, yeah, I've not seen anybody like this in town before. Uh, are you here for First Moss Festival? That's part of it. I think it's uh, always fun to look into look into local customs and whatnot, but we're, we're actually uh, adventurers on a, a bit of a task and Fives here uh, told us that you were someone to talk to. Aye, I could be helping you, but the question is, what is it you are looking for? Uh, I'll kind of lean in. Well, a, a good drink, firstly. Um, great conversation, secondly. And thirdly, we're trying to find the uh, the White Fire Arcanist. Mm-hmm. So in order of inquiry, she gets you a mug of ale. She'll get a mug of ale for everybody who wants one. Uh, she'll nod and say, well, the Arcanist is quite busy, but you, if you've come from far away, I'm sure that she'll be more than hospitable. I mean, the hush wouldn't be here without her. She she keeps the whole place under the, the the powerful ward, so that no danger from Sablewood can be passing in the town. Uh, right now, her house is to the south, through the farmland, and it's uh, hanging from one of the trees. You really can't miss it. Oh, okay, that sounds great. She must be very um very powerful to keep a place like this sustained in the way that it is currently, huh? Yeah. It is one of those things where we have learned that if she ever is asking for something, we give it to her. Seems like a, a good working relationship that you all have. Indeed. And then uh, she also uh, pulls out. Uh, where is it? Ah, yes. She pulls out a small stone and uh, shows it to you and says, Well, uh. If you are here for First Moss Festival, perhaps you would like to indulge in tradition. We have uh, stone painting classes. We have arm wrestling competitions. We have marketplace of trinkets. Uh, what is it you would wish to be doing? Or are you just here for the ale and the arcanist? Well, our, you know, arcanist we got to take care of first. But, you know, I'd, when we're done, I'd love to love to show off my painting skills, of which I am skilled and plentiful. Of course, I'm lying. <laughs> How long does the festival go for? Well, it's a celebration of the very first layer of moss growing upon the crops in Sunless Farms, which means that they're beginning to ripen. So we will have a, an abundance of fresh fruits and vegetables soon. Kari's going to down her mug, look over at Garrick. Let's get our work done. We can come back and play. Um, it was phenomenal talking to you. What, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is uh, Luasa Stalwin, and my accent Luasa is all Stalwin. over the place. Hey, that's all right. I'm not going to judge you. There's, you know, a bunch of mixes of cultures here, so you, yours is just unique. I'll give her a wink and give her some gold. All right. So if is I understand correctly, you're going to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, is Barnacle there with Garrick and I? Unless Barnacle wanted to be somewhere else. No, you guys hear the plip plapping of him running around. <laughs> but yeah. Barnacle, Barnacle, where'd you go? Hi. Oh. Did you, did you want did you want ale? Did you want some? I got you a glass if you wanted some. Oh no no. Can't drink. Body's a temple. That's good. <laughs> One day. 
uh, Carrie, do you do you want you want his 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 mug? She's already drinking it. Oh, okay, Very valid. Valid. I guess yeah. We'll uh, we'll head back out to Marlow to tell her we got to go south through the farmlands to the hanging uh, house from a tree. Now, uh, as promised, when you return to your shoes, they have been shined immaculately. They even spark nice. a little bit if they uh, have a bit of metal on them. And my question is, what small trinkets have been left for you? Fresh, uh, fat flies for a barnacle. Nice. Okay, I like it. Uh, I think some of those stones that the, the dwarf had. Okay, the painted stones. Okay. Uh, mine has like a handcrafted friendship bracelet that has somebody else's name on it, so it's probably in the wrong shoe, but <laughs> that's okay. What? Uh, just out of curiosity, what name does it say instead of Garrick? Uh, Clarence. Clarence. Okay. Yeah. Clarence will remember this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not Garrick. It's Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Filled with spelling errors. There you go. But yeah, uh, you return to find Marlo, and my question for Marlo is, what have you been doing this entire time? I, I picture Marlo, like, with both hands on her staff, just, like, guarding this cart with her life, and anyone who gets too close, she's giving, like, heavy dagger eyes to. She's not relaxed at all. Love it. But yeah, you spot your fellows coming out of the Clover Tavern, and they seem to be in slightly higher spirits. I'm going to hand trust... Marlo a painted stone. And she looks at this and she says, I trust you found your... Oh, and she puts her hand to her nose. King's blessing. What is that smell? Uh, the part of the charm of Hush. It yeah, take like... your shoes when you go in. So, uh, The whole place smells like sweaty foot. That That is an apt... Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, It's kind of kind of charming when you're in there. Oh, I, I see that my decision to remain behind was perhaps very wise. Uh, did you find anything about our target? Uh, yes, apparently uh, Whitefire Arcanist is south of here through the farmlands. Uh, her house is hanging from a tree, apparently. Uh, so probably won't be super difficult to miss. And um seems like she is the reason that this kind of protection field exists here. Uh, it looks like the people here in Hush really uh, really owe her a lot and uh, respect her and like her a lot. So Interesting that she's created the protection, but she herself doesn't enjoy it? She's outside of the field from Hush and in a tree, you say? One note of GM clarification, she is still within the, the barrier, it's just that she's on the edge of it. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. So the farms are all within the barrier? Yeah, the farms are in the barrier. Like, the the ward around Hush is quite expansive. Gotcha, okay. Um, I, yeah, I have a feeling she'll, she's probably still in it, but um, I don't know. Seems like everybody here uh, here is a fan of her, so that's a good sign, at least. Yes, I suggest we continue. I, for one, would be very glad to complete this delivery. Yeah, I agree. They have this festival going on, so if we can complete that, they have like fun games and stuff. It'd be kind of kind of cool to hang out with the locals tonight if if we uh, can get this done. I see. Well, remember we do have another visit that we have planned with whoever was trying to arrange our ambush. As soon as we deliver this crate, hopefully we will have time to catch up with them. Oh yeah, that should that should be that should be quick. Kari's gonna hop on up on the cart. I imagine with with Garrick and yeah. kind of whis- whisper down at him. Uh, Do you think she'll ever lighten up? Uh, probably not. Maybe marginally after we get done with the job for maybe an hour or two, but that's probably all we're gonna get. So I'll help Barnacle up into the cart too. He'll clap as you help him up. No more napping, Barnacle. Oh, oh. Okay. We start playing three-person rock, paper, scissors in the back. And Marlo starts to direct the cart, I guess, 
she could see very clearly perhaps how to actually get south to this farmland is is there uh, is it pretty easy path. to navigate through here yeah there's mm. uh there's a stone path actually that leads uh past the farmlands of hush nice yeah, I think she'll drive the cart, and anyone in the way, she'll shout out to them, excuse us, excuse us, coming through. Important business. So, nice. you maybe get about five feet down the road, and people are already giving you a wide berth. They uh, they see you're on a mission, and they're like, yeah, we're not going to get in her way. Um, so, you then begin passing through the farmlands of Hush once you get outside the homes of the village, which are, again, all carved into the trees. Um, what you see is that the crops are all cultivating this very thin layer of glowing blue moss. So maybe that's why they call it first moss, because mm -hmm. that's when the crops begin to grow moss for the very first time. And interestingly, they have that same bioluminescence that the ivy did. And you, if you listen carefully, you can even hear this kind of like a heartbeat as you pass by. But what you also notice is that as you, again, continue this path through the trees is that the trees in this area all have something carved into their sides. And as you look carefully, they're like hundreds of these like unique faces with eyes looking in every direction. So kind of like, um, oh, what is it called? The, uh, the source wall in Marvel. At least I think it's Marvel. Or is it DC? Is it DC that has the source wall? Um, I... But basically, like, instead of it being a solid trunk of tree, imagine just a bunch of faces carved into it. Interesting. And then my question is, what else do you all notice about these trees that put them different from the rest of the trees you've seen so far? Huh. Um, I think maybe maybe these, these just smell really nice in comparison to the footy smell of... Uh... The tavern, there's just kind of a very pleasant, pleasant kind of fruity scent in the air. Okay. Noted. And I was thinking if they have faces, maybe they're speaking or singing or whispering. Like maybe there's a reason they have faces. Mm. Oh, I like it. So maybe there's kind of this light wind that blows to the area. or And it's one of those things where you hear whispers on the wind, but you can't quite make out the words. But every time the wind blows, you get that sense that there's like ephemeral speaking, maybe. Ooh, terrifying. I love it. Yeah, I like it. Now, the good news, though, is as you push through these uh, unique trees and the unique farmland, is you eventually come to a tree that is taller than the rest. And it's easy to identify as the Arcanus home because her home hangs from a braid of rope that is as wide around as Kyrie's forearm. So it's a massive, thick rope. And this rope is tied to a massive branch and is counterweighed by a cabin-sized boulder at the base of the tree. And the stone itself is marked with a collection of symbols and the cabin windows uh, flash with a somewhat steady soft yellow-green light. What would you all like to do? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> and pile out. Grab the cart or grab the... <clears throat> grab the case box thing. Um, yeah, start start shuffling the crate out. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll help carry with that. And I guess yell up and see if there's any response or. Okay, so you call out, you you shout uh, to try to get the arcanist attention, but there's no response. But the light still flickers. Nice. Okay. Um, I definitely don't want to cut the counterweight. That's like the that's that's. <laughs> Stop that! It, does the tree look a uh, uh, climbable at all? Or it does. Can Marlo use her arcane sense? Any kind of magical presence? The rock, the tree, the rope, mm -hmm. the building, all over. All got of it. it. Got it. Yeah, hey, uh, Barnacle, can you? Uh, you can climb stuff really good. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Uh, Kerry, okay, you wanna you wanna you wanna toss him up a little bit and you can climb the tree and see if uh, see if our contacts up there. <laughs> She'll kind of stretch her muscles a bit there and look over a barnacle with a grin. No, wait, one, no, wait. Uh, and he's gonna cast a uh, shadow stepper. Okay, what is it? 
<laughs> uh, so spellcasting finesse. Um, you can move from one shadow to another shadow. So um, fun. I can anything I, I can see within range. So I'm gonna step into someone's shadow and then emerge. If there's a shadow at all, I can see up top uh, on the house. Uh, I can emerge out of. Got it. I'm just trying to, is this a, here it is. I found the card. It doesn't appear to have a range, but it does have a spell cast on it. Okay. So go ahead and roll with finesse here. And again, uh, since you uh, stepped in late uh, in foundry in the macro bar, lower left, there should be a uh, dice macro for you to use and it'll handle all the rolling for you. You just have to add the modifier. All right, what'd you get? Uh, you rolled a 20 with fear. So you did succeed, but I get another fear. I love it. So there are a number of shadows. The question is, do you want a shadow within the branches of the tree? Do you want a shadow within the hovel or the hut itself? Do you want one maybe halfway up the tree? Like, what kind of shadow do you want to come out of? Well, seems like the graceful type. He's going to go into the hovel. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so what happens is one moment you're among your fellows. The next uh, is a almost like uh, the Hag's Hut in Baldur's Gate 3, where it is a collection of eclectic of potion bottle eclectic collection of potion bottles spell book runes plants small little creatures but the weird thing is it's not messy and the reason for that is because the arcanist herself appears to be this seven foot tall mix of humanoid and firefly so kind of a larger fairy and she actually looks a little bit startled as you come out of a shadow and she goes oh dear who who are you the moment he sees these little knickknacks, even if she's staring at him, he's just going to start moving them around, like just completely destroying whatever order they were in. Oh, how dare you? You come into my house and you start moving my things around. How dare you? I have oh, half hi. a mind to blast you out of here. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, habit. Hmm. Uh, my friends, the downstairs with a crate delivery. Uh, oh. It's fresh. So you're the group that uh, Emrys sent from the capital, then. Oh my, you're rather late, aren't you? Well, let me let me invite you in. And please, no, put that down. Put that down. Le le leave the little squirrel alone. He doesn't like it. Starts balancing things. And uh, everybody else, you just kind of saw that barnacle vanished. And then the next thing you know, the home is lowered down on the rope. And it's one of those things where the counterweight stays where it is. The rope stays where it is. But it's almost like the rope is elongating as the home lowers to the ground. And like a blooming flower, it actually opens up to accommodate you to come inside. Oh, fun. It is entirely possible that the Arcanist has uh, taken offense and killed our friend. But I think we should still continue and see just in case. That would that would be sad, but I hope he's okay. <laughs> Let's go figure it out. Start dragging the crate in. Yeah, I think Marla will I'll go first. Okay. Yeah. So you step over the threshold, and in, immediately you enter into the same space that Barnacle is in, and you see the Arcanist. Same goes for Garrick and Kyrie, where you step past the threshold of the barrier, and you are in an extra dimensional space of some kind. And one thing I should qualify is that this treehouse is quite spacious. Like, it's definitely a, a bigger on the inside situation. Mm -hmm. um, but as you all step in with the crate, the arcanist kind of squints her eyes at the crate. And she goes, oh, well, if that's what I think it is, then perhaps uh, we should cut to the chase. Yes? Yes, I am Royal Mage Marlowe. Sent here on behalf of King Emrys to deliver this to you. Uh, you do identify yourself as the White Fire Arcanist, correct? Uh, yes, that is me. Uh, I'm the only Arcanist within the within the Sablewood at the moment. Of course, it's me. But uh, one moment, and she kind of light hops, but also light flutters over to the crate, and then she 
how do I want to say this? She kind of like does the E.T. thing where the tip of her finger lights up and then she touches it against the magical seal of the crate and the crate opens up to reveal a massive stone with a lion's face carved into it. And Marlo, you immediately recognize this as the key ward stone of the capital city's gate main archway. Wow. And the arcanist, for her part, kind of nods and goes, Well, this makes sense why the king was so secretive about this delivery. If anyone knew your city was no longer warded, you would have been conquered before sunrise. Indeed, in fact, a trap was set up for us along the road here. Do you have any idea who might have might have wanted this? Well, that's, uh, what is the expression? A uh, barrel of worms that, if someone knew about this delivery... Well, as I said, they could do untold damage to your city. Though, it could have also simply been an opportunist. We have, again, had the number of merchants coming through the area for the first Moss Festival, and it's hard to say whether you were simply a matter of circumstance or if someone was actively working against this warding. Indeed, we were told it was from a female dwarf. Uh... The brigands were hired by one to, uh, to to seize the crate. Do you happen to know of who they were describing? No, unfortunately. I don't make it a habit of going into town. It smells very weird. Mm, it's true. It's true. I agree. Would it be possible for you to reseal the crate and we could take the empty crate with us? Uh, to what end? To use as... Bates to find out who was after it. Oh, perhaps, perhaps, but we need to reinstate the ward on this stone as soon as possible, but I will need your help for the process of recharging this ward will attract some very dangerous creatures from the darkest reaches of the Sablewood. I will need you all to defend me. Would not the town's defenses protect you? Isn't that their purpose? Well, for this, we must travel to the Open Vale, a spot outside of the ward. Well, what, is, what is this Open Vale? Is it some sort of um, magical significance in the region? A ley line of some sort? Or? Yes, it is indeed a, par- a part of the ley line of the area. It is a magical clearing in the shape of a perfect circle, and it is the only place in Sablewood without trees to block out the sky. It is a font of energy, a font of energy we will need in order to replace the ward, the such powerful ward, upon this stone here. Um, this whole time while she's been talking, Barnacle's been, like, rearranging things, but he's also been, like, moving books around, flipping them upside down putting them uh, spine first, so it's just uh, pages that you can see. Nice. But the moment she describes this, he immediately plip-plaps over quickly, uh, and he just looks up at her, and uh, he uh, has this, like, determined look in his eyes, like, I, Barnacle of Clan Kerr, son of Mitt, will do my best to defend you. Do I want to make this a roll? Yeah, it's, it's funny a, enough it's that deal. I want to make this a roll. Uh, go ahead and roll me a presence, please. Macro bar. A 19, so you actually get a hope for your troubles. So, you succeeded with a hope. So the Arcanist is going to kind of look at the the havoc you've wrecked on her, her abode, and she goes, I am going to trust you with my life, Little Ribbit, because if I don't trust you, I'm sure you're going to come back here and make an even bigger mess of things. <laughs> he puts down a couple of items that he's managed to pickpocket. <laughs> oh dear, I'm going to have to do inventory on everything when you leave. Mostly spoons. More spoons than she even has. He's, he's giving her spoons. I didn't even have that spoon. Well... 
Where did you get a spoon? It's gold. <laughs> Why do you have a gold spoon? Well, he can almost over one smell pack. gold. Yeah. Arcanist, you must uh, forgive my party. We are very good at our job, I, I promise you. Um, when would you like to leave? Oh, at once, unless you have a reason for delaying. Do... I... Does anyone else know of your mission? Or at least that you would journey to this open veil for the ritual? I ask because it seems as though there has been a leak of information, and I wonder if a trap might be set for us. Uh, that is my question. Well, as I said, it's hard to tell whether it was a leak or if you were happenstance, but no one will be able to miss us departing to the south once more outside of the village, outside of the ward. I, I suppose we could move at a pace that would let us catch anyone following us, if that's what you wish to uh, guard against. I think that would be prudent. Um, also... Oh, I'll put this to my party. We could take our cart, of course, and perhaps travel faster, or we could leave the cart, traveling ourselves, uh, perhaps a little more stealthily. No, no, I am far too old to walk that distance. We will be taking your cart. How how long uh, will the travel be by cart, Arcanist? Oh, just about 30 minutes. Nothing too power or too long of a journey. Well, um... We're not going to force you to walk if um, your knees don't allow it, so... Oh, it's not just my, ease, my knees, young one. It's my back. It's my feet. It, it's, just, it's just a bad situation all around. Of course. We'll, oh, we'll and, uh, do what we can to uh, protect you when the time comes. Um, let, us, let us help you down then, yes? Yes, yes. And we mustn't forget the ward stone. Of course, that's the whole reason we're here. Does that still require two people, or? Uh, yeah, it still requires two people. Okay. Yeah, but you can put it back in the box. It's just not yeah. going to be magically sealed anymore. Yeah, might as well. All right. So, uh, at a unseen command from the Arcanist, the mm -hmm. treehouse lowers once more and opens up and disgorges all of you, so that you can get back on the cart with your valuable cargo. And since you all have made a note that you are going to be looking and traveling in a way that lets you keep an eye for people following you, um, I would like anybody who has the inkling to, to roll me an instinct. But not like multiple people rolling instinct, just whoever would feel the most paranoid or the most attentive in this moment. That's a Marlowe roll, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, Marlowe's <laughs> yeah. good at this, so maybe. Uh, could I use a hope and my experience would be not on my watch? I'd allow it. Yeah. Cool. Yes, I think that's what I got. I'll be rolling a plus three. Nice. Okay. Okay. So with your plus three, you get past the threshold of 10, which means you've succeeded with hope. So take that hope right back. And uh, good news. You are not being followed. Uh, in fact, it doesn't appear that uh, not even the strange hybrid creatures of the Sablewood are really stalking you or looking like they're going to cause a problem. Hmm. Copy that. I think as as we're riding, I, I imagine Marla is probably the one driving the cart, and she looks back to Garrick mm -hmm. and kind of gives you a gives Garrick sort of a like a motion to come forward to the front of the cart. I'll uh, climb over and sit next to you and be like, "How uh, can I help you?" Well, my friend, uh, I couldn't help but. Well, the description of this place from the Arcanist, the, the open veil that we're moving to, she mentioned it that it's a font of chaotic energy. Mm -hmm. I may need to rely on you and the rest of the party even more th than usual. Um, I, I uh, And she looks very nervous when she's saying this. this is, she's dropping a little bit of her, mm -hmm. her disguise, which is always like her confidence, I guess, yeah. is breaking a little bit. And she says... As you know, sometimes my magic is a little difficult to control. I worry that if I'm in a place where arcane energy is uh, chaotically present everywhere, that, uh, well, I may be a little more hesitant to, hesitant to use some of my abilities. Hey, 
I'm not going to say I'm an expert on the, you know, magic thing or anything, but, um, you know, you and I, we go way back. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't trust you completely, Marlo. And um, your determination is uh, always, always present and active. So uh, I have faith in you. We all have faith in you. Um, we'll protect you till the end. But I think when don't get rough and, uh, you know, things are on the line, you always pull through. So. Thank you. I, uh, I think you'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you for your faith. I just felt if the success of the mission comes to, well, I should, I should, it should be incumbent upon me to let you know that this could be a source of weakness for me. Uh, I don't know what we're walking into. It may be a place that makes it impossible for me to be able to use my, my abilities to protect us. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll brief the others and we'll make sure to, if that does happen, we'll, we'll compensate for that. But, Hey, even you uh, identifying this as a weakness is a, another another version of your strengths, Marlo. So just keep it up. And uh, we're going to get through this nice and easy. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I also don't carry the Arcanist's uh, suspicion. I, I believe that perhaps there was information leaked, maybe from the capital itself. I don't think that we were just accidentally set upon on the road. I... I worry that there is someone or something that knows our mission. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Um, those, uh, thistle folk, you know, they obviously hit up that, that merchant caravan or that cart thinking it was us. And, uh, you know, that poor, poor guy paid the price. Um, and some, someone will answer for that, but we gotta, we gotta deal with the, deal with the punches as they come. So we'll take care of this. But once we, once we solve this problem, we'll definitely look into, what comes next and where the leak is. So, but I think your, your instincts are correct yet again. Thank you. Thank you. She looks very quickly at one of the trees, maybe as the cart was going by and it made a loud <laughs> whisper and she's, she's really on edge. Right. I like it. All right. Yeah. I'll go back and just tell people, Hey, <laughs> step up. <laughs> yeah. You know, do more, do better. Yeah. <laughs> Get all Marlo got the critical successes. Now it's our turn, guys. Come on. There you go. All right. Well, I like rolling with fear. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I said, I like rolling with fear. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Gives gives the GM fun things. It is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, After about 30 to 45 minutes of traveling, you do pull into a very ominous, mysterious clearing. That, as described, is quite literally in a perfect circle among the giant pink redwood trees. Hmm. And you can look up. You see the night sky now. And as the arcanist uh, flutters off the cart and steps down, she kind of looks up and goes, It's been some time since I was here. I think the last time I was here is when I made the ward pillars that keep hush safe and... I almost died in that ritual, but uh, it's not important. I can get us through this ritual just fine. But uh, help me with with the um, with the ward stone. I'm I'm old, you see. I I can't lift it myself. Arcanist, is there any way that I might assist you? Not without risking your mortal soul, unfortunately. part of my duty if if that would aid in the ritual i'm I'm willing to take that chance in that case uh perhaps i can figure out something for you to perhaps redirect the energy to keep it flowing into the ward stone as i manipulate it but i will need about an hour of time to prepare for the ritual itself uh all of you, you, you included Marlo, uh, enjoy the night air while you can, for when the ritual starts, we'll be very busy very quickly. What um, what type of threat should we expect, just uh, in case it's something we can prep for? Well, the very forest itself. Uh, ancient spirits, uh, wraiths, perhaps some undead... Oh, uh, it's hard to say what could come out into the clearing. Alrighty then. Good good to know. All right. 
where would you like the stone to be placed for the ritual? Oh, right here in the very middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess we'll put it down, and then I'm assuming this is a narrative path to a short rest. If I yes, if this I'm is the narrative path to a short rest. <laughs> if I'm picking yeah. it up correct, nice. Yeah. Okay. So during a short rest, uh, it's the same as it is in fifth edition. It takes an hour of time. But each PC can pick two of the following options. And it's also on the uh, GM screen in Foundry. But for the people at home, I'll read it out as well. So you can clear 1d4 hit points or you can tend to an ally. But I don't think anybody took hit point damage. Uh, You could clear stress. So I guess uh, since the only person to take stress was Kyrie. Kyrie, you could clear 1d4 stress, but you only took one stress. So you just clear it. Right. Um, again, uh, Kyrie, you're the only one that took any armor damage, so you could repair your armor uh, there. Um, and then everybody else, you could prepare, which is you telling me how you prepare yourself for what's to come, and by doing so, you get a hope. Nice. Uh, okay. I actually want to do something. Oh, what would you like to do? Inspirational words. Ooh, what does it do? You can imbue your speech with enhancing powers. You can make a, uh, you can mark a stress when you recite your words and choose an option from the list below to grant to an ally who hears it. Clear stress, heal a hit point, or gain a hope. Huh. So and I don't know is what there a role involved with that? No. I just take a stress. Just take a stress. Uh, as far as I can see, I don't know if it applies to all the allies. I'm going to say just singular because of how the wording looks. Yeah, I'm reading the card now. It says an ally, not all allies. Yeah. Um, but one observation I have here is that you could give these inspirational words to everybody. You would just have to go, you know, one by one. Right. And then... That would then, you'd be able to clear the stress based on the short rest. So it's kind of a, a quick way to heal stress or hit points and get hope from what yeah. I'm reading. Yeah. Okay. So could I just say three stress for one nice little uh, quick speech? Sure. And then we all get one hope. Mm-hmm. Marlo has oh. one stress that I was going to take off, so you could probably just skip Marlo Barnacle. I, I can still give you a hope, though. Sure. If you want to. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, that's a fun little ability. Yeah. And uh, Barnacle, uh, as everyone's gathering up there, he goes up. <laughs> um, yeah, some, something I was once told when I became, um, you know, this. Um, you know, when he pulls up two daggers. He's like, uh, if you make yourself more than just a ribbit, if you devote yourself to an ideal... And if they can't stop you, then you become something else entirely. For I am Frogman. Garrick wipes a tear from his eye. Then he patters off. I was really hoping that we would get Rainbow Connection. (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) Start singing a song. Perfect opportunity for it. Is that a new type of hybrid? We we, we do hear his battle cries. Are you going to do, like, I don't know why, but I was expecting Braveheart for some reason. Yes. <laughs> yes. I look over, look over to Kari and be like, God, he, he, he has such a way with words. <laughs> wipe the, wipe the single tear. All right. All right. Nice. So yeah, uh, those of you that uh, heard the speech, you can get a hope, you can clear a stress, or you can clear a hit point. Um, Barnacle, I think we need to roll a 1d4 for you to see how much stress you recover from the short rest. Okay. All right, you get that three right back. Well done. Beautiful. And then, yeah, uh, let me just go down the line there. So we've handled, uh, we've handled Barnacle. Uh, Kyrie, uh, are you going to do the stress and armor thing or do you want to get hope? How do you want to play it? I'm going to go ahead and do the stress and armor, and then I'll get the hope from from the speech. So that'll bring me to two. Okay. Marlo, what about you? Yeah, Marlo's going to do the same as, as Kari, um, because Marlo had a stress. She's going to wipe out the stress and then get the hope from the 
ribbiting speech of Barlow. Oh, I see what you did there. Well done. Well done. Uh, and then finally, Garrick. Uh, I, the only option I have is to do the get a hope. Um, I'm curious. Uh, like, I'm just going to, I have a whetstone, so I'm just going to sharpen my longsword uh, and make sure that my short bow and, and quiver have the arrows perfectly, perfectly aligned to make grabbing them easy. Uh, because I'm very much expecting combat, so as you should, as you should. All right. So what you're going to do is about an after an hour, hour fifteen minutes. So it takes a little bit longer than just an hour. But eventually, the arcanist who's been kind of fluttering near and fluttering around the ward stone in the center of the clearing, um, she suddenly lets out this shill cry and she says. The keystone has finally responded. Quickly, quickly, surround me. The ritual must begin or I'll lose the pathway. Hurry, hurry. And uh, her body begins glowing brighter and brighter as uh, her eyes sort of roll backwards a bit. And the keystone itself begins to lift a foot off the ground. And not moments later, there's this unearthly cry that echoes from the woods and Marlo, since you are sensitive to these things, you sense that a massive amount of energy is flowing into that wardstone and has awakened some things in the surrounding mm-hmm. forest. Nice. What so, a surprise. Uh, what I would say is that if this were a battle map situation, I would lay out uh, a battle map for us here. But we're going to try Theater of the Mind because, again, I want to see how we do Theater of the Mind in this session. Yeah. Um, just in general, where would you all be in the clearing? And maybe use the cardinal directions, so north, south, east, west. Where would you be, each of you, where would you each be in the clearing at this point? Um, I'll, go ahead. Go, oh, go. Oh, sorry. I was just say, I'll watch, I'll watch west. I'll watch, I'll watch the west side. But I've got a bow out, so I can kind of float. Try to pick off some some bad boys as they're advancing. So, so let me actually write this down. So, we have Garrick to the west. All right, uh, I'll just go down the line. Who wants east? Uh, Barnacle will take west. East. Nice. Okay. Very well done. Uh, who wants? Is north? that south? Is west south? <laughs> Maybe. It's whatever direction Barnacle believes it is, which for us, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, imagine uh, he's just looking straight up. <laughs> yeah, he's covering the four, the third dimension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the third eye is fully open. Mm-hmm. He sees Bisky as he clicks, trying to bug Superman. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Kyrie, do you want north or south, or do you want to double up with Garrick or Barnacle? Well, uh, the Arcanist is in the center, right? Correct. Okay, because I wanted to have Kari just right up very close range with her to protect nice. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you I mean, stay I can. Nearby? Yeah, I want to stand nearby her, but you know, I could be you know facing the south. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then Marlo, if I understand your intention, you also want to be nearby the Arcanist. Yeah, I think Marlo wanted to stick near the Arcanist, but ever, it looks like the one direction we need to cover is north, so she'd probably face north. So I'm going to put this in chat before I describe the enemies that come out. So uh, we have a clock on this encounter. And what this clock means is that whenever a certain uh, condition appears on the field within this battle, I will tick down the clock from eight. And there's also a way for the clock to tick up. So you're going to have to pay close attention to how the clock goes up and down. Okay. But what I would say is that as you all get into position, you all feel a great rumble in the ground as four ancient skeletons uh, wielding a series of rusted short swords begin to rise from the ground as if disturbed by the forces of magic being used by the Arcanist. And in the distance... You also see these spectral forest wraiths that float ominously out from the trunks of the Sablewood. And your goal is to keep the Arcana safe until the clock has completed its tick down to zero. Okay. 
So, uh, there is a skeleton at each of the cardinal directions, so north, east, west, south. And the two forest rays are going to be at east and west. And at this point, again, the way combat works is the players can act until either I interrupt or until you roll fear. So who among you would like to act? Uh, if nobody else wants to, I'm just going to try to take a quick short bow shot at the first skeleton on my side, see if I can get rid of it, uh, just yeah. to kind of thin the herd. Um, yeah, that sounds good, because Kari will be staying in close. All right, okay. we'll do... Yeah, go for it. Let's do it. Is there anything special here? All right, so short bow plus two to hit here. Roll 15 fear, is more than sufficient, 17. and you have right. rolled with fear. Copy. Uh, but I still resolve the action before anything else happens, right? Correct. Gotcha. So it is a 1d8 plus 3 on the damage. Okay. Um, Let me check. Uh, not enough to kill it. So you pull out an arrow, oh, actually, you knock it, you hit the skeleton, but it doesn't quite crumble at the strike of the arrow. It still seems to be standing. All righty. All right. Well, since you rolled with fear, I'm just going to put this in chat so that we have a, a record of it. Um, mm -hmm. It now comes to me. I only have enough action to activate one thing. So yeah. what I'm going to do is I actually am going to use my fear to buy. Let me make sure I'm doing this correctly. I think I have to spend two fear here to make the action tracker become a five. And again, I'll put it in chat so that we can follow this correctly. And then I'm going to use another fear and four of the action tracker to trigger all four of the skeletons at once. So if I did it correctly, okay. if I did it correctly, it should be one, one across the board. Yeah. So it's one fear for two on the action tracker. Correct. And you, if okay, I read cool. this correctly, you can swap two action for one fear or right. one fear for one, oh, two fun. action. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Nice. Yeah. So what that's going to mean is the skeletons will all come rushing at the four of you. And since there's one of you at each of the cardinal directions, um, all of you are going to suffer five damage from an unavoidable attack as the skeletons wow. unleash a special group attack that is able to get past your defenses. So I Can need... we use our armor? Yes, you still can use your armor okay, here. Okay, cool. So I'm, again, since this is kind of our second combat, I'm going to go down the line. Uh, Barnacle, uh, you have three armor, so you could mark an armor to only take two, uh, two damage, um, which would be just a stress for you. And then next up, I'm going to go to Garrick. Garrick, you have seven armor. You can mark that seven armor and take nothing. Yeah, I'm going to mark that seven armor and take nothing. All right. Kyrie, you have seven armor. Same thing. Yep, same, same. Sorry. Okay. And then Marlo, you have five armor. So again, you could mark an armor and not take anything. Yep, I think that's what I'll do. All right. So what ends up happening then is uh, the skeletons wail on you with the swords, but for the most part, they're not able to really get purchase in your body or they're not really able to really hurt you in any meaningful way. And that means we now go back to the players. So who among you would like to act? Are they all within like a uh, uh, close range? Yes, they are all within close range. I would like to act unless someone else would like to go. Go for it. Go for it. So what Marley would like to do is cast a rain of blades. So she's going to spin to hope and conjure throwing blades that strike any enemies close to her. So I think that's all the skeletons. Mm -hmm. So I got to make a spell casting roll to see if she actually hits. Nice. I like it. Now, is it one spell casting for all targets or is it multiple? So the way it says is um, make a spell cast roll and all targets that you succeed against. So I don't know if it's one for each or if you want to do one for all. Uh, Let's do one for all because I think it, the way it's worded, it says make a spell cast roll, not multiple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also going to mark a stress because I'm definitely going to use my primal origin 
to either increase the attack or increase the damage. Uh, we'll see. So I'm definitely going to do that. Okay. Yeah, I'll roll. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I may also use another hope to use my experience for Royal Mage to give myself a plus two. Okay. So I'm going to roll a plus four. Nice. So, so that 22. is a total of 22, and you get a hope back. Well done. Yeah, Sweet. and an 18, more than sufficient to hit all these skeletons. Uh, so let's see. Um, I'm going to roll. It's uh, They're not vulnerable, are they? They are not vulnerable, no. Okay, so it's just a d10, and um, let's see how it says to do the damage. They take 1d10 damage. So I, I think it sounds like one roll, and they all take the same one. That's how I yeah. read it, yeah. Neat. Okay. Let's see. Um, I might. Hmm. Gosh, that's like almost the average. I wonder if I should roll again. I think I'll I'll stay with it. Five's not bad. Five's not okay. bad. So what that's going to mean is you unleash these magical blades that slice into the skeletons, and one of them, the one that Garrick hit, is going to fall. Cool. The other three are going to still be like skittering and clanking and hmm. moving unnervingly, but they are still going to be standing, unfortunately. Copy. But we continue with the players who among you would like to act next. Okay, Kari will go next. Okay, what would you like to do? See, these are all within close range again. Yep, you're all close enough that they're in close range. Okay. Then I'm going to tap her Guardian Unstoppable class feature. Okay, what does it do? Okay, once per long rest, become unstoppable. I can add, I have a counter, it starts with a D4. And then each time, I, anytime I roll damage dice, I reduce the die by one or until the scene ends. Okay. And with the damage dice, I gain extra resistance to physical damage. I add initial d6 to any damage, and I can spend stress to reroll a single die. I like it. Yeah, that's really cool. So I'm going to use that in tandem with Whirlwind, assuming I can successfully hit one. I'll be able to hit all of them. Okay, nice. let's see the roll. Beautiful. Okay, so this is going to be her strengths. Oh, and I guess I should update the tracker. That is what the tracker looks before Kyrie does the roll. Copy. Okay, rolled with fear. A 12 is just barely enough to hit. Kyrie doesn't know how to roll any other way. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to spend the one hope then. And this is going to be 1d10 plus 4 damage for the first one. And then the additional ones will take half. Okay. All right. Why don't you describe how you wipe out the remaining skeletons? <laughs> Nice. So as the knives come, you know, flying into them, she's she's looking around, surveying, and she just holds up her battle axe and gives a you know a war shout and starts spinning around in a circle around the arcanist and Marlo, who's nearby, just holding her axe out in front of her and like spinning like a little mini giant tornado. Beautiful. Yeah, you uh, you turn into a blender and blend those bones, turning them into bone meal. I love it. But yeah, uh, since you did roll with fear, we come back to the enemy side of things. And at the moment, it is just the two forest wraiths. So I will use one of the action tracker to activate one of them. And I believe that they are going to use their life drain ability. The question is, who is our lucky winner today? Uh, choo -choo -choo -choo. I'm going to nominate Barnacle as our lucky winner today. Poor Barnacle. Oh, no. Has yeah, done anything. Tribute. <laughs> no, 
oh, it's okay. Barnacle's standing there, looking straight up, not even participating in the combat. <laughs> like, All right, Barnacle, what is your evasion? Ooh, where is that? Uh, 13. Pretty good. I have rolled a 15, unfortunately. Right. Oh. So, uh, what this is croak. going to mean is you will take 1d10 plus 4 magic damage. All right? What? So you will suffer 5 damage, which again, looking at your armor, uh, you could spend another knock on your armor to take only a stress here. Uh, sure. Okay. Now, by I my reckoning, that means you have charges? one. You have one, because yeah, Charged. you had three charges yeah. of armor, so you're down to what, one charge remaining? Yeah. Okay. So, just keep in mind that once you use up all those boxes, you can't use the armor anymore. But yeah. Understood. So, what this looks like is a kind of swirling green beam kind of lances out of one of the race palm to hit Barnacle in the stomach. And Barnacle, you feel as if, like, your last meal is being ripped out of you spectrally. And in fact, we see those... Nice juicy flies you were left earlier. We see sort of spectral images of them uh, travel through the beam into the forest wraith. And the, gl the wraith glows as if healed uh, or gained a little bit more health from that effect. Well, that's just not fair. But that's all I think I'm going to be doing for this action. So we come back to the players. Fun. Uh, let's see. So just these two forest rates currently, right? Correct. Um, I feel like I'll test a theory here. I have a feeling that my short bow isn't going to do very well against these things. Um, but I must discover. Um, yeah, let's see if I can uh, get get a shot on the one to the to the west side. Um, okay. And we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Once per long rest. That also doesn't really work. Uh, yeah, no point in doing that. Okay. Um, sweet. We'll just uh, we'll go for it. 19 is more than sufficient, and you roll with hope, so you even get a hope back. All righty. And then 1d8 plus th 3. All right. Nice. So you attack once more, and your strike is true. You do hit the one to the west uh, where you are. Unfortunately, it's as if your attack is going through a incorporeal mass. It still slows down a bit as it passes through the wraith, but it doesn't do as much damage as you were hoping it would do. Okay, I will. Uh, I will note that and tell the group. <laughs> Uh, looks like uh, physical means don't do too well. Um, I'll look to Marlo and <laughs> give her a quick wink. <laughs> I think Marlo's going to take the hint. Um, Marlo can act now, right? Or yeah. Does... Okay. I think Marlo's going to go for all the beans here. She's going to uh, unleash chaos on um, the one that's... Well, they both attacked Barnaby, or Barnacle, didn't they? Just one. Oh, which one attacked Barnacles? That's the one she's going to go for. The one to the east. Okay, so we're going for the one for the east first, and if this turns out well, I have a plan. So nice. uh, do a spell cast roll for Unleash Chaos. Um, I'm going to use both tokens mm -hmm. and see what happens. Um, actually, I think this is so important. I'm going to use another experience for Royal Mage. Mm -hmm. That's a plus four to hit. More than 19? sufficient. A 19, and you get a hope back. Okay, so let me um, mark that down before I forget, because I want to do more here. Um, so I did Unleash Chaos. I used two tokens, so that's 2d10 two D2 D2 damage. But I'm also going to spend a stress to use my Primal Origin to hit an additional target within range with the same spell. So they're both going to take 2d10 of damage. Okay, noted. Because they're both within far range? Yeah, they're yeah. both within far range, right? Okay, so I'm 
So it doesn't say I need to do another roll. It just says I also hit an additional target. So yeah, I'm assuming I, I can do that. Works. Okay. Yeah. They both get 17 magic damage. Okay. Which right. is enough to make them take two HP worth of damage, which means one of them has, and I, I'm going to put it here in chat so we can keep track. So East Wraith has two out of 10. West Wraith has three out of 10 at the moment. And actually that's wrong. The action tracker after you've moved should be four. Um, but yeah. So what does that look like when you unleash this chaos? Yeah, so I think Marla, before, when she's cast her magic, like when she created the blade, she was a little more in control. Like she she conjured that purpley energy, uh, like when she created the fire before, and that was able to you know create those blades that she threw out. But this time, I think it's a little more in control. It's, it's a lot more, well, to use the description of the spell, it's a lot more chaotic. So maybe she's channeled here the open veils magic a little bit. And she, she rolled with hope, though. But I think she might actually be a little afraid of what she's doing. She's losing control a bit. And her magic is taking on more of like a, more of that like ethereal flame as before, and she holds out both hands and like a stream of flame hits each uh, hits uh, each of the wraiths. But you can tell as she's done this, like she doesn't seem that it's it seems to have had more impact than she was hoping. Okay, I like it. So uh, I don't think this is a narrative moment for me to interrupt the action. So it is still the players go. In fact, uh, let's go to either Barnacle or uh, Kyrie because I don't think either of you two have acted in this combat yet. Let's go to Kyrie. Okay, Kyrie, what would you like? Well, I guess I guess I take that back. Barnacle, you're the one that hasn't acted because Kyrie did the whirlwind. Oh, okay. Um, so just a wraith near me, huh? Yeah, there is a wraith at far range from you, and he doesn't make a shadow. Nope. I do have a long tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? It's funny. I'm going to use it as an attack. I uh, take a stress and I unleash it as a finesse close weapon. Oh, I guess it's. Well, you I could move. You could easily move up to yeah. close range and then attack. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. And it's a finesse plus two. Oops, wrong. Uh, so that 16. is more than sufficient to hit, yeah. And it is a d12. A three, okay. <laughs> so after all of that, your tongue lashes out, you strike the wraith, and uh, since you're using your tongue, you get this taste of, like, ash and fermented something spoiled it is it is just nasty in your mouth and you're going to be tasting that for probably a week at this rate nice. oh, no. well, well the wraith got a real tongue in. <laughs> so after that we i actually amended they are they only have six hp not 10 as i actually caught that but i think now yeah. is a narrative moment i'm going to spend a fear to make it my turn again and I'm going to activate that wraith you just attacked with another fear. And what they're going to do, uh, Barnacle, is they're going to reach out and they're going to place a hand upon your left cheek. And uh, I want to hear, what is a terrifying moment in Barnacle's childhood? It was when the orcs raided his clan. They set fire to multiple huts. And his father was slain by the horrible raid leader, Ms. Piggy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I love it. That was the end of Mitt. Yeah. Oh. Yep. All right. Well, uh, what that's going to mean then is you are going to be considered vulnerable until your next rest. And what that means is that whenever I make a roll against you, I get to roll 2d20 and take the highest. It also does a little bit of magic damage, which, if I read this correctly, is like, wow, that's a lot of magic damage. So I rolled low, but you will take nine Whoa. magic damage here. Uh, 
So it's one d twenty plus two on damage. Yeah, unless unless this is a misprint, it is legitimately a one d twenty plus two. One d twenty on damage is wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 down. This no, no, is no, no, no. Well, kill us. you have to remember is that it is so it's nine damage, which would be for you it would be major because again it works on thresholds here. Right. So oh, okay, if yeah. you were between four and nine damage, you would mark one HP. If it's between nine and fourteen, you would mark two HP. Two HP. And anything fourteen or higher would be three HP. So this is basically the one shot resistance that's built into the system. You can still uh, use okay. armor on magic stuff too, correct? I believe so. Yes. So you could technically spend your last armor to reduce that to uh, six, so you'd only mark one HP here. Oh, uh, we'll hold off on that. Okay, so you're going to mark two. All right. Neat. So uh, after you relive that terrifying moment in your childhood, we come back to the players who would like to act, because I think everybody's had a chance at this point. Kari would like to come to the defensive article. That's okay with everybody. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. You see a single tear streaming down one of his eyes. <laughs> the reflection in his eyes of the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. the fires of the hut. <laughs> All right, so I still have Unstoppable going, so that's going to add to the roll. Okay. So I'm going to close the distance to Barnacle and to get into melee with this Wraith. Okay. And I'm going to tap the experience. I've got your back to add a plus two. Okay. Make sure to spend the hope. Okay. So that's going to bring this to a plus four. Okay. A seven is not oh. enough, unfortunately, and that is with fear, so I do get a point of fear here. Well, it's going to be with the plus four, though, so it's a little Still not enough, unfortunately. I think. Let me just double check. Yeah. But yeah, um, so one thing I like about this, and I'll say this now, is that it's not like D&D where it's like, oh, I missed. I guess my turn's over and I got to wait 20 minutes. You could conceivably act right away and attempt again. You don't have to wait for, quote-unquote, your turn if you don't want. One of the features of Unstoppable here is that I can spend a stress to re-roll any single die. Oh, yeah, definitely do that. Okay, so I take it the red one there, that was the fear die? Mm, So the top die was the hope, the bottom die was the fear. That's the hope, okay. Yeah, okay. so go ahead and re-roll just 1d12, and we'll see if it's hopefully higher. That is... Okay, so it goes from a roll with fear to a success with hope. Very well done. Um, so yeah, now you will be able to hit it, no problem. Okay, so I take one hope there. Mm-hmm. Okay, now Unstoppable here adds an additional damage die, so can I type that all in at the same time, or does it have to be like a separate roll? Oh, you should be able to type it in all at the same time. Survey all right, so it's going to be uh, D10 plus 4. Plus a d6. Okay. All right. 15 damage. That is significant. So that was physical damage, right? Yes. Okay. So your axe comes down and very similar to Garrick and uh, Barnacle's attack. It's like you're pushing through water, like you're attacking water. And you, by all rights, this would have normally like done a significant amount of damage to any other opponent. Mm-hmm. But this Wraith, this Wraith has barely taken anything. Damn. Is the other one within range? No, the other Wraith is across the clearing from you. Okay. Which actually, I have to amend that. Let me quickly amend it because now it's it's both of you. 
Uh, at the east is where that is. Got it. Okay. And then, since I'm so close to Barnacle, I have the domain effect of I am your shield, so I can spend a point of stress to take damage for him. Very nice. Elh, the three six that you have for each of the wraiths is—is is that something that now it's four six three six? Um, what does that mean? So they have six hit points, and I'm just using Total, this to keep yeah. track. As isn't so we all can keep track and make sure I'm doing it right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm keeping their thresholds a secret, but the East Wraith has two more HP remaining. The West Wraith has three HP remaining. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Copy. Thank you for asking. But yeah, um, I don't have the fear to really make this my turn. So no. who among you would I... like to act next? I think Marla could go with another blast. I mean, that was a ton of damage before, but I think yeah. we're getting close. I, I, this is an interesting kind of mechanical question. There mm -hmm. is no major mechanical benefit for me to go in this combat. Because I have just physical weapons and no major things to pierce through any resistances they have. So mm -hmm. why would I, right? Like it, it, It's more mechanically sound for me to sit here with five hope and do nothing rather than attacking, potentially getting fear to activate an enemy mm. and then doing little damage, yeah. right? Am I missing something? <laughs> no, I think that's a that's an astute observation where I can tell why they made these forest wraiths uh, sure. resistance to physical damage because most yeah. of the characters are. And they're trying right. again. They're trying to pump up Marlo. Like yeah, Marlo exactly. is unleashing her magic and doing in, amazing things. In the circle and the chaos. Yeah, totally. It, it, it fits narratively, narratively. I was just curious... If I was picking up on that accurately. No, no. They need I, it. Un, unless I'm misunderstanding, you are completely correct. Like Interesting. And I think at this point, you know, because I think Marlo's pretty much going to one-shot these, I'll just tell you right. right now that their thresholds are 1, 10, and 20. So for wow. the most part, a physical character's only going to be doing 1 HP one, at a time. 1 HP. Wow. Yeah, it's it's practically impossible for any of us to hit I think they need another combat like assist mechanic of some kind. Like right, because mm -hmm. I keep wanting to like set up something to yeah. assist, but exactly. there's no major way to do it without spending the hope and doing the tag team, which is only a one. Yeah, I keep looking at tag team and trying to figure out a way I can help when I. Oh no! Hold up, we're forgetting weapon. a very important thing. Uh, you can help an ally by spending one hope, and you can add a one d six advantage die to their roll. Oh, yeah. And so okay. that that I can do on my turn, or not on my turn. You can just do it whatever is or whenever, as far as I read. Oh, but okay. Like, well, I I guess that answers that question then. Yeah. Well, that's like like Star Trek, right? When you're assisting in a task, you, right, how, right? Like how are you assisting to how damage you doing something it? that yeah. you can't damage? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have to ask you: How are you providing advantage to whoever you're giving the one d six to? Sure. I yeah. I would like to assist here by just uh, firing off a, a couple of arrows at the forest wraith's face to maybe not <laughs> do any damage to it, but just to piss it off and make it look at me funny. Okay. So then, no, I think yeah, that would Marlo, help Marlo. I think uh, I yeah. think you're rolling with advantage here. Yeah, that would help Marlo a bunch because yeah. then I don't necessarily have to spend my hope on a royal mage to to increase my my chance to hit. I mean, right. I mean, yeah, that nice. would that would actually help me quite a bit. Yeah, or I I'll absolutely do that. Or I still do that to make sure I hit because then I could use my um, stress spent to increase or to hit the mm -hmm. second one. So that's probably the better thing to do is yeah, just like superpower my chance to hit. Yeah, I'm gonna just keep doing that then. Okay. That's what I'll do. I'll spin one hope to uh, get Royal Mage for a plus two. I'm also going to... Uh, yeah, this is where stress for Marlo I can see can really just build up very quickly. So I'm going to take one stress to be able to cast Unleash Chaos again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's going to be... Yeah, plus four with advantage. So 21, 21 with hope, one. more than sufficient. Nice. 25 total, yeah. So that's 2d10 because I bought back the two tokens. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to use another stress to hit the second one with the same thing. Okay. Oh, that's sad. Do you have Nine any damage. way to bump that up? I already gave myself a stress to um, 
to hit the second one and it doesn't say it doesn't say specifically that I can do because it has a list of things you can spend the stress to get. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't say that I can do that like multiple times. It only mm -hmm. mentions once and I did that to hit the second one. So I don't think so. Got gotcha. it. OK, so you are going to unleash that same fire that you've been wielding the entire adventure. But unfortunately, it's just not enough to take down the wraiths. I mean, they still take some damage, but it just, it's just not enough. You just a little bit more of a push and you would have gotten the East Wraith down. But <laughs> you're almost there. I, I believe in you. You can do is there is there a mechanical thing we do to make them vulnerable? Or is vulnerable more an effect that they get from themselves from abilities? I'm just curious. So you I can... I was reading the keyword, but I didn't. Yeah, it's a it's a condition that can be affected on any creature, uh -huh. but it would be something that is listed in the attack or something that is listed on your spell card or your normal Copy. card. Okay. Um, so the vulnerable that they imparted on Barnacle, for example, mm -hmm. um, is something that is flavored in their attack. Interesting. Okay. Very. Yeah, fun. it's very similar to Fourth Edition monsters, which could do, and the target is ensnared or the target is restrained, and you know things like that. Oh, cool. I, sorry, ELH. I know this is taking us back. So if you yeah, say, okay. I can't do this, that's totally fine. Uh, she does have an ability in her class feature that says once per long rest, you can place a domain card from your loadout to choose either gain hope or add magical damage equal to twice the level of the card. I'm asking that because I have a card that says it's level one. That's the Reign of Blades. Can I give that to get two points of damage on that last attack, which I think would have taken it to... An 11? Major threshold. That would have been enough, yeah. So okay. in that case, you will destroy the East Wraith. So why don't you describe what that looks Interesting. like? Interesting. Super cool. So she's giving up one of her spells basically to do this. So I imagine she's channeling this chaos even further to the point to where like, she took stress. She's almost to the point where she's taking hit points damage. She's probably going all out at this point. There's like flames that have just totally engulfed her. She's drawing flames up from the ground. And uh, yeah, she throws a big ball of purpley, like shiny flame at the one wraith and just like totally destroys it. Nice. But yeah, at this point, it looks like she might almost be on fire herself. I think she's going so so heavy into this. Sweet. All right. Now, to make things interesting, I am going to take away. How do I want to do this? I'm going to substitute two of the action track or for the action tracker. Mm hmm to get two fear and then I'm going to immediately expend one of those fear to seize the initiative. Actually, yep. I think this is more of a narrative. I think it's fair for me to say that after this attack, it would make sense for narratively for the, the race to go. So I don't need yeah. to spend the, the fear, yeah. um, but I will still spend the activation on the action tracker and I will spend one fear because Marlo, you're the star of the show. The Wraith recognizes this, and what's going to happen is the Wraith is going to attempt to do the same thing to you, what it did to Barnacle. Mm, so it's going to kind of float up, and it's going to put a hand on your cheek and try to make you relive a terrifying memory. But I still have okay. to roll. So your evasion is, remind me? A nine. A nine. All right. Uh, 16 is more than yep. sufficient. So what is the uh, the terrible memory you relive as you end up taking a total of six damage? Huh. So Kari and Marlo were childhood friends. I'm going to say that they have another friend that Kari doesn't maybe know this, that uh, one of Marlo's worst memories was when she was first learning how to use her magic when she discovered it, that she may have actually... Uh, killed one of their friends. Maybe not as close of a friend, but maybe like someone else that they were acquainted with. And Marlo covered it up. And she's very ashamed of that fact. Hmm. I like it. I like it a lot. Super fun. Now, one thing I'm also going to do is with my remaining fear, I am going to use what is known as an encounter uh, move, which lets nice. me spend one fear to call forth two additional skeletons and add two to the action tracker. So Ooh, okay. there are now a skeleton at the north and the south, and they are within close range of all of you. Okay. So that should be what we're looking at in terms of fear in action tracker at the moment. 
The clock is at three. So you're almost there. But we now go back to the players who among you would like to act. Um, I'd like to try to, I mean, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, try to try to shoot one of these new skeletons that has just arrived. Okay. Um, and I'm curious, can, can in this system, you know, like D and D and stuff, you can action move. Is that a thing that can kind of move with this system as well or? Yeah, so it's as far as I read, you can basically move up to far range. Um, okay. It's only if you're immediately challenged or there's conditions that would prevent you from moving that you would have to roll an agility check. Okay. But there's nothing stopping you, so you could move up to far range. Okay, yeah, I was just curious if I could, you know, pop a shot off at the south skeleton and also rush towards it. So in the event that I am not able to down it, I'm its primary target if it's trying to attack someone. Yeah, I like it. I like it. All right, cool. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll run towards the uh, South Skelly and see if I can get him. Seventeen oh, with, with fear. fear, so that is enough to hit it. But I will get a point of fear. Yep. All righty. One D eight plus three again. All right. Do you have any way to buff your damage a little bit? No, only if I roll a one or two on the damage die. That is that is all I can do. Okay, so you are not quite able to knock down the South Skeleton. So you came close, like just literally one more point of damage yeah, would have done it. Yep, yep. Um, but since you rolled fear, comes back to me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to spend that remaining fear to summon another two Skeletons. Okay. And this time they're going to be at the east and the west. So we have one at we have four skeletons on the board. And I'm going to spend Yeah, I'm going to spend the two action tracker that I have. Uh actually you just went. So it would have been I would have had three. I'll spend two mm-hmm. that the cell skeleton's going to attack you, Garrick. Yep. And uh do I want to be mean to Kyrie and Barnacle? Bring it. How do you feel about this? No, should I should I bring it? Oh, you know me for the beans. Yeah. All right, we're for the beans and got it. All right, I'm gonna do Garrick first. So Garrick, what is your evasion? Nine. Nine. Okay. Well, they don't actually have a modifier on this, so five nice. hits you completely. Um, Barnacle, I get to roll two d twenty and take the highest because you're vulnerable. Oof. Whoa. Oof. So the highest was a 17, more than enough to hit you. And Barnacle, My... you will take 3d6 plus 2. Now, yes, I know you're about to take the attack for him. Yep. But uh, that would be 14 damage. So how does that work with the Guardian? Do you take all the damage? Do you split the damage? It says that I take all the damage and I reduce it by my strength. Okay. So I, we rolled a 14. Two. Your strength yep. is two. Correct. So it would be 12. Right. Which is just shy of a major. Yeah. So you uh, I take one point. Yeah. Just one, one measly point of HP. I love it. Neat. All right. Well, uh, that's all I can do. I've spent all my resources. So we now go back to the players. All right, he's going to take a swing. All right, what you got? Now that we have skeletons on the boards, just kind of pats the axe in her hand. She's like, skeletons, how quaint. Mm-hmm. And she's going to uh, attack the ones closest to Barnacle and herself. Okay. Okay, so I still have Unstoppable going, so it's going to add to it. Okay. And would the I've got your back still apply in this situation? I believe it would. Okay, so I'm going to use that. That'll be my last hope spent. Rolled with hope. 17 plus modifier, more than sufficient. Oh my god, I ran with hope. What? Yeah. 
Is how many of them are close to us right now? Uh, just one to the east is the one you're near. Just the one. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna hit on that one. That'll be the one d ten plus four plus my d six. Okay. Nineteen. How would you like this uh, skeleton to go down? <laughs> uh, standing over Barnacle, kind of, kind of as I'm laying on the ground here, I'm just swinging over him, and just completely obliterates at just powder shards going everywhere. Love it, love it. All right. Well, again, I don't have enough action tracker to make fear. I don't think it's a narrative moment for the skeletons to act. So we continue on the player side of things. Okay. Should Marlo try to take out this last wraith? Yeah. I yes, think some so. magic stuff on the big boy. Yeah. I think I'm going to do my, uh, you know, what I've been doing before. I'm going to use my experience for ro Royal Mage for a plus yeah. two. Yeah, to give me a plus four for my in with instinct included. Mm -hmm. Now, one question I have for you. Ooh, with fear. I like it. Um, are you still going to do the stress spend that you have? Well, it says I can declare that after I do the roll. Okay. Um, so the, the options are extend its range, add a plus two action, reroll any number of dice, or hit an additional target. So I'm probably going to do the additional you. target. Yeah, what I would tell you is that if you've been paying attention, every time you kill something, the clock ticks down by one. Ticks down, yeah. Yeah, but so I'm... the one thing I would ask is how much stress do you have remaining? Uh, let's see. This would be... I have three stress, so she would actually have two more stress before she starts taking hit points. Okay. She's been burning quite a bit of stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm cool with that. I think I'll hit another skeleton. Um, so they just killed the one near Barnacle and Kari, right? Yep. So there's one to the west. There was one to the east. One I'm to the east, the west, and the south. Mm -hmm. I'll get the one to the south. Okay. And then also hit the wraith. Okay. Uh, but that's I'm. We'll see if that even does enough damage to kill him. Seventeen, 17. magic. So yeah, why don't you describe nice. how Marlo once again saves the day and uh, takes down both the Wraith and the remaining skeleton? So I think at this point, the Inferno, that's the purple burning flame magic around Marlo, is starting to kind of come to a head because I say this as I look, and I think I have filled up her stress track. So the next time she takes stress, she'll actually start taking hit points damage. So... I think, uh, yeah, she does this. It's a big ball of flame that takes out the wraith, another one that takes out the skeleton, but she actually lets out a scream of pain, actually, as she does this. Yeah. But yeah, I think the whole circle is illuminated from, from this torrent of magic she's casting. Nice. And what I'm going to add to that is that the ritual comes to a close right as this happens. So this soundless explosion emanates out from the wardstone completely evaporating the remaining skeletons that are on the field and everything falls quiet. However, the arcanist who now looks even older than she did before, uh, she kind of looks over at Marlo and even with exhaustion in her form and her voice, she says, you're too young to burn yourself out. Calm down. And she sort of waves her wand and a splash of water just like slaps you lightly across the cheek. Is it like a a good thing or is it just like a... It's I'm like somebody's taken a bucket of water and just dumped it over your head. Okay, okay. So maybe maybe a bit of a refreshing situation. Not right, like right. I just, I'm going to slap you thing. Okay. No, no. This is more of a calm down. Here's a bucket of water. Got it. Okay. Is, is that it? Have you you've done it? Yes? Yes, the ritual is over. Now, the keystone will, will need a week before you could take it back and have it put into its proper location. I'll, of course, need to watch and make sure it doesn't crack or become sentient or anything like that. You, you know how it is with magic. 
in the meantime, I mean, please avail yourself of... Uh, I would offer you to stay here, but I think if I let the frogs stay at my abode, I would never know where anything is anymore. But uh, you could stay in a hush nearby. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to give you a few rooms. And once uh, once everything has settled, you could take the keystone right back to where it belongs. You're positive Article. you don't need one of us to stay with you to watch the keystone? I think I'll be okay. Uh, unless, of course, it becomes sentient. Because the last time it's something like this becomes sentient, it was a very long and tiring affair. But the odds of that are astronomical. Do you have any um, quick, spooky, magical ways to reach us if we're in hush? Or... Yes, and in fact, I'll give it to your little frog friend. In fact, I actually think the little frog friend has it in their pockets already. Barnacle will walk up to her and hand her a timepiece that's not even hers. It's just nice. someone's else. Nice. I have no idea who or what this is. <laughs> just smile and say thank you. It's a gift. All right. Thank you, I suppose. Good job, Barnacle. Yay! Good job. Is he throws arms up in the air when he does yeah. that? <laughs> of course, he does yeah, very yeah, noodly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and with that, I think that's where we're going to end today's session. <laughs> that was yeah. great. So yeah, I mean, we noted a few things uh, yeah. during the session itself, like you know how the race were really, really hard to kill. Um, yeah. And we also noticed a few things with hope, like it needs to be a little bit more obvious that hope can be spent to assist. Um, but I'm just going to go down the line and see if anybody has any extra feedback they want to have on record. Uh, so we'll start with you, Lone Squiff. Uh, anything you'd like to enter in? A uh, pretty positive experience. Uh, I liked all the the things that, you know, we got to add flavor to the, yeah. you know, the tavern and whatnot. That, that was really cool being able to do that. A lot of player driven narrative stuff was really mm -hmm. cool. Um, I did feel a little useless in the final battle until the skeletons showed up again mm -hmm. so yeah that that aspect of the adventure itself was was a little weaker um if there was something uh better to do with the assisting definitely yeah gotcha and i think again part of that is the resistance to physical damage cutting it in half rounding up um you basically are playing chip damage until Marlo can come in with the big whammy is what's happening there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was right. very, I mean, it's, it was cool to have an adventure focused on the one character, but it, at the same time, it, you know, took away from, you know, everybody else in the spotlight. Right. Right. And I, I would agree that does seem to be a weakness of this adventure where they deliberately say Marlo must be played. And again, I get why they did it. It makes sure. sense in the narrative. But if I were running this at a convention, I'm not so sure everybody would have been happy with that. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting choice, and I guess it it is a choice that is that is built on the idea that the narrative is the core aspect of this system, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it feels like that is like their big big selling point. I'm curious, I'm curious to play more of it. Um, I think it was fun. I think we all played really well. I think that you guys like great players, great great. GMing EL, I mean that was that was awesome, mm -hmm. but I feel like like this like Garrick's build is really strange. Um, I don't know if it's like the class like you you guys get the thing like whirlwind right that tenacity or whatever thing to just give you extra whatever it is the the guardian ability mm -hmm. right like that seems really good. The thing that the warrior gets is ignoring burden when equipping weapons. Okay, like. Cool, I guess. So I have a secondary weapon, the, and the, I get to add add damage to it if it's physical equal to my level, which is one. So that's that's fine, and that'll obviously get better as you level up. But it it just it not it, it's very interesting to see like the level one balance. Like you guys were slapping out, you know, multiple d tens worth of damage to to. to multiple creatures and the best i have as a level one warrior is a d8 plus three with a bow mm -hmm. and there's no there's no way that i can tell baked into this this class or pre-build to in any way 
add to damage other than that. Right. And I'm Which isn't necessarily at... a bad thing, but... Right. I'm actually looking at your cards, and it looks like even your subclass card... There, we So we forgot about that. Or So if you had I, rolled with fear, yeah. you could have gained hope. Once I never failed months. a roll with fear. I only yeah, succeeded... So... Full that call, that card didn't come into play. Um, you were never then, targeted by a ranged attack, so you couldn't. Correct. You couldn't have increased your evasion. So yeah, and then I I never had. I don't have anything baked into this other than that avoid a ranged attack to use stress. So I never spent any stress. Right. So the call of the brave. I never had the ability to gain stress back, and I was always pretty much maxed out on hope until we discovered that I could use them to help. So. Mm -hmm. It is. It is interesting. It's not not bad, but it, it's definitely definitely an interesting kind of um, kind of play path, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. I would have to look and see what they get at later levels because there's got to be a reason for that. Right. Oh, a hundred. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm gonna go to Shizno. Shizno, uh, anything you'd like to add to the record? Uh, a little bit for Garrick there. Uh, they literally just made you Lydia from Skyrim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, carry my wares. <laughs> like, have some yeah. dragon scales. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm to carry your burden. I'll carry your burden, Marlo. <laughs> um, no, for me, I, I thought that the system is is interesting as um, yeah. as a, as a beginning. It's like this is some neat foundation. Um, there definitely needs to be some trimming, yeah, because like that that fight there, like uh, I didn't get too much. Right. <laughs> I became the shield. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, the playtest was definitely interesting. Uh, I do like the aspect where the players can help flavor things. Yeah. Um, I do think that I could get crazy if the players go too far with it. So mm -hmm. I like the idea of like the GM just like asking one or two players uh, for different things and like asking different players too. Like I think that would be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but just don't don't have everyone lift off, you know. Like it looks like the Empire State Building. I'm like, well, <laughs> it's a tree, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I like it. And I think it 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 speaks to the the point where since this is a narrative system, the fact that they're trying to bake that in even in the play test, I think speaks well for the system. Um, because if you get players in the mindset of being willing and able to contribute meaningful but not like super crazy things to the narrative like it sets that expectation early if that makes any sense yeah the one thing i'll say though for a rogue to have inspirational word that's really cool mm -hmm. definitely yeah, kind of do, pushes the class yeah. outside of its you know normal gimmick I, I do like like the concept of the the domain decks right now they each have the overlaps i think that's something very fun and so you can Probably do a lot of very fun stuff with that, um, but of course at level one we're limited to what the pre-builds are, so it's it's mm -hmm. the kind of I'm not quite sure what the what the grander scale is and all of the the fun kind of weird combos, but I'm sure I'm sure there's some interesting things you can do with it. So yeah, definitely a lot of customization option there. Yeah, yeah, a, a lot of customization. All right. Well, Josh, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I have, I have a lot to say about Marlo. So I think first, Marlo, I think she's the wrong character for one shot. Like, she didn't fit in this party very well. I think she mm. would have been better as a support mm. character. You know, like, if she had Enjoy. magic that actually made the rest of the party better, I think mm. it would have been a lot more fun for everybody. But as she was built, she's just a blaster. You know, that's yeah. really all she is. And also, like, going further, like, if you look at her cards... I think a, a novice, which I'm definitely a novice, but I think for a person that doesn't run RPGs all the time like I do, who's used to like reading between the lines on how things work, the combo that I made at the end that was doing so much damage took a combination of three cards and then her one ability and her class feature to work. And I don't think most people would get to that in a one-shot like intro adventure. I, I, don't, I think she's too complicated to be in, in the one-shot. I think she should be something different. But she was a whole lot of fun, like burning stress to do more. Right. And then, you know, that that mechanic of like, uh, I was increasing more risk to myself to do more. That was fun. But I definitely felt, too, that like I couldn't. I think it would be more fun, especially in a narrative system, to be able to make the other people in the party also better. But mm -hmm. she had nothing. She has nothing for that, like nothing at all. Yeah. And I would I would echo that sentiment where. Again, this was very much a module of Marlo is the star, Marlo is doing everything, Marlo, Marlo, Marlo. So, right. 
and that's that's not fun. That's not yeah. fun for a one shot. That's that's also something that I, that I find interesting. That like the only magical character is is the star here. So I'm curious if if there is like some sort of intrinsic balance kind of shift between magical and physical characters in this system. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm, I'm curious how it would play if there were two two magical characters and two physicals to see how that would kind of balance things out. If it would make Marlowe feel less like the star because there's someone else that can kind of compensate for that mm-hmm. or or kind of how how that would play because yeah you being the only only magical caster in you know a, a kind of narrative that is focused around that character while also having a combat that is focused around magical damage with you being the only one that can really accurately and and aptly do that it does feel like oh okay so we're just we are just kind of here and letting mm-hmm. <laughs> letting marlo cook which is fun but yeah, in a in a in a one shot kind of scenario, it is it is an interesting choice. Yeah. I think I think most of that could have been fixed though if she was a support character instead of a uh, blaster. Yeah, so like what if yeah. what if she's spending stress or she's taking hit point damage to make all of you be able to attack with magical damage or something instead? Right, right. Yeah. To buff somebody's weapons to change yeah. the damage type or something. Yeah. And then it's that weird like dissonance of we're trying to beat this clock more enemies are coming she's supercharging all of you but she's like slowly killing herself like that would have a lot more friction than just oh look marlo's blasting again look at that right mm-hmm. now, yeah because I, I yeah sorry i was just looking at the characters you know we didn't have a variant character i know those they do have a spell cast ability too right but it uh-huh. also does physical damage like marlo is the only character unless i'm missing something that does magical damage yeah, because the the ranger has like magical abilities, but don't I think they all at least at level one do physical yeah. damage type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it does say physical damage. Yeah, but it's a spell ability, so that's kind of weird. Right for yeah. for Marlo, uh, the way Josh you played her and described how she was doing stuff, uh, it actually made me think of Vermintide too. Um, Serena. Mm-hmm. You know, oh like, sure, yeah, yeah. I think I think also they need a they need another thing like the using experience you know to to give advantage or to yeah to give advantage like that's cool but I think there needs to be something else like if there's so much based off like combat is so big into this it seems like I think mm-hmm. it needs something more mm-hmm. for an assist like if if they don't have a true support class or if they don't have way more support mechanics they need something else like that I think like it was right. very it was very telling like when Garrick got to that point like what can Garrick actually do it was like Need something to do that's more fun for Garrick. In this case, it's like it's okay to make a combat where Garrick's strengths aren't played to, but he also needs something to do that would be fun. And I don't think Garrick got to. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't the, think Garrick got to have fun. Yeah, I mean, no, no intrinsic support stuff in any way from his kit. It's all just, I mean, just stuff for him. The the thing I try to like the battle strategist is like the only thing he has, which is just like. If you grapple something, if I grapple something, I can do some damage to it. That's mm-hmm. that's all also, that is. Also, I thought of something. I think the hit point mechanic is great for players. I don't know that it's great for NPCs or monsters, mm-hmm. though. So, like, mm-hmm. what? Why it's great to stop bursting is it keeps players going more, but it kind of takes sure. away that cool burst that players get to have that that win they get to get when they roll the big damage dice, because mm-hmm. then. If NPCs have the same mechanic, then it works for them too. I think it'd be more fun if they actually would die quickly, like if you rolled higher dice, because like then right. the GM could use their fear to spawn more, which is good fun for them, and the players get the fun of like, oh, I just one shot this thing, which you can't really do in this mechanic, you know. Hmm. Well, part of that I think is just based on what the thresholds were given. Um, so mm-hmm. the skeletons would have gone down if you did eight or more damage, which was you guys kept rolling just one short right. every time. Seven, yeah. Um, but you're completely right in that, again, returning to the Marlowe problem, the race major threshold was 10, and you would have had to do 20 physical damage in order to right. do two HP of damage. Um, and there's two of the things. Like, I would understand if this was a solo encounter— like that would have mm-hmm. gone well, but there's two of the things. Yeah. Um, but there is another thing I'd like to say is that in reading the uh, 377 page PDF, 
-hmm. There is an optional rule that if you exceed the severe threshold, you take 4 HP of damage, but you're still right in that a player could do all this amazing combo, all this work, do all this damage to I, and then it only does 3 or 4 HP. Yeah. Yeah. you don't want to one-shot characters. You definitely don't want to one-shot PCs because that's not fun. But you do want to in- you do want to one-shot monsters because that is fun. That is a lot of right. fun. But it's fun now with this system they've set up. It's fun for both sides because the GM could spend their fear mm-hmm. currency to to bring in more uh, things to fight. So I I I think that actually and it might actually be a little bit more book keep, bookkeeping on the GM side. So I kind of hope they change that. Right. Well, I should I should maybe qualify in that the the fear move that let me bring in additional skeletons that was specific to that encounter. So it wasn't just a oh, general GM move okay. that I did. It was specific to that encounter. Hmm. Which so from, uh, from what else you were reading is there? So that generally isn't a isn't like a baked in GM mechanic, right? Fear for summons. That's that's not always going to be a thing. No, it is, as far hmm. as I read, that is specifically something they did for Vengeance of the Veil vale for that one encounter. Interesting. Um, which I understand why they did it, because sure. skeletons are easy to kill, and if you kill yeah. eight of the skeletons, the race get killed by the burst from the ritual. Right. right. Um, but I also was very running low, very low on fear. And That I was, was another thing con- I was curious about, yeah. I mean, I was even converting from the action tracker into fear, and I was just low on everything. Yeah. And fear is also what GMs use to activate like special abilities on creatures, right? Correct. Yeah, like so the memory it feels delve. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, the memory delve I used on Barnacle and Marlow, like that costs fear to even do. Um, otherwise, I just have like a piddly little one d ten plus four, you know, magic damage. Right. That's that's like the problem with Star Trek Adventures. If you don't have threat, then you kind of can't make really good encounters at some point or you can't scale up an encounter if the players are doing re- really well they'll just like curb stop mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. so I, I think maybe they should consider being that a, a choice for players just like they yeah. do in, in star trek adventures like i want to say you know what i roll poorly i want to give you fear wanna, for yeah, me to 100%. succeed somehow yeah yeah and I, w- I would echo that like if your players are rolling hot they're going to roll hot and they should be rewarded yeah. for it but if that's what's happening most of the time then the GM's just kind of like, and you win again, yay. Like, there's right. nothing in there to keep things interesting. Yeah, the, the narrative slows down exponentially, because, like, if, if all you have is success and no no fear of anything, then what's, what are we doing? So mm-hmm. it's, it's too bad, too, that it's just, like, 5th edition or other D&D games where, like, your to-hit role is the most important role, because if you right. miss it's game over. Like there's nothing else you can do. So yeah. maybe that would be a great place to insert a fear mechanic where you could buy like sure. plus one or plus two for, for giving the, the DM fear. Yeah. Oh, that was right. fun. I had a blast. I thought it was great. Oh yeah. yeah. Me too. I, Absolutely. It, as long as you all had fun, that's what I'm going to take this as a victory, but I'm definitely going to yeah. go to the, the play test survey after this and enter in all this best I can. Um, so there's good ideas here. There's ideas that need refinement, totally, yeah. and there's ideas that need to just be thrown out. I think. Yeah. Um, how, but again, how did this you is... feel about like the D20 for you as a GM rolling? So I'm a little weird in that I like it because uh-huh. it's not something where I have to do some special die. It's not like yeah. oh I've got to remember to roll this die and this die. Like it's just D20 plus modifier, and that doesn't mean that I have to do like special macro work i don't have to specifically have the the sure, character sure. blocks entered like i would for fifth edition i can just push a button and go makes sense um, okay but also, i GM- do oh go ahead elh i was also thinking like uh, you know most power by the apocalypse games the gm doesn't roll anything i think what mm-hmm. this this stands out a little bit is it's kind of a pseudo power by the apocalypse where the gm actually rolls something right. would it be was the rolling fun for you or would it be better without a roll you know, now that I look back in the encounter, now that I've run it, I think it would have worked better if the skeletons and the wraith just did damage rather than me rolling for it. Mm-hmm. And maybe instead of it being, oh, a 1d20 plus 2, what? Um, maybe right. it's just this character takes 2 HP and that would scale sure. up uh, the threat very quickly. And it's weird because I've looked at the subreddit and some people have run this and gone, yeah, my player's almost TPK. You know, the race, we're kicking our asses. And hmm. 
you know, it, it's very easy for the Wraith, if you have fear, to be right. very deadly very quickly. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it feels like this system would be very difficult to balance. Like, if you're yeah, a GM and you want to pick a creature to, to like plug into a counter, like, CR sucks in 5th edition, but it kind of works. I don't know what you would have here in place of CR. Right. It feels super swingy, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. And there is and a bestiary in the 377 whatever. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked at it completely yet, so I don't know how they're doing it. But I went through guess... a lot of them completely. Com- I mean, like the the spread is so huge, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was trying to kind of like somehow compare them to CR because they do like I think they call it difficulty in this or challenge like twelve. 13, uh, I don't know. They call them tier one, tier two, tier three. Yeah, and they have the interesting thing with like the different types of adversaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the bruiser horde, I think that's kind of the way to balance. If if I was reading it right, mm-hmm. where depending on the type of encounter you're trying to build, you build them using different kind of adversary archetypes. Is what it looked like. Um, Same thing that we but, did in fourth edition. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So it, it seems to be very much pseudo inspired by fourth edition with a lot of their own kind of spin on things yeah all right well with that i think that is where we will draw things to a close uh youtube thank you so much for tuning in thus far we hope you had fun and i would say definitely go ahead and try the system out at your own table uh because the more feedback Mm -hmm. we give to darrington press the better of a system we'll get at the end of the day but yeah uh twitch stick around because we're gonna raid somebody but youtube we'll see you later Bye, YouTube. Bye, YouTube.